Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, all right, um, let's start our afternoon session. So our first talk is uh, Virtual Machine Reset Vulnerabilities and Hedge Cryptography. Our speaker is uh, Thomas Ristenpart from uh, UC San Diego. Thank you. You guys hear me? Yep. OK, uh, uh, so let me just uh, start off by summarizing um, what I'm going to be talking about today. So the first thing is, is something that's, that's kind of bad, and, and these are what we're calling virtual machine reset vulnerabilities. And so the basic problem is that, uh, say you have a virtual machine, you take a snapshot, and now you resume that snapshot on two different occasions. The problem is that, uh, as we'll see, software ends up reusing some cryptographic randomness that's gotten captured in this uh, snapshot. And this can lead to catastrophic failures of, of cryptographic protocols that rely on the randomness. Um, so this is, this is pretty bad. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about something that, that uh, is better, is good, which is uh, what we're calling hedge cryptography. So we're going to particularly try to address uh, this fragility of the cryptographic protocols to the reset um, randomness or to other uh, types of randomness failures. And so the idea is to provide um, you know, frameworks and, and for showing that you can take uh, cryptographic operations, like routine operations like encryption or signing, uh, and make them more um, secure in the face of increasingly worse randomness. And so we'll get into that uh, uh, kind of in the second half of the talk. So this is joint work with a bunch of different people. The first uh, part is joint with uh, Scott Yillick from UCSD. The uh, um, hedging cryptography is with lots of different people, Mihir Bilari, Savika Brakursky, Moni Naur, Gil Safiev, Hobav Shakam, and, and also Scott. So let me uh, start off by recalling a bit about RAM number generation and, and what's going on with it, because this is uh, kind of the core of, of everything in the talk. So we all know uh, cryptographic RAM number generators is um, very important. And in general, in, in practice, they're kind of implemented in, loosely in the following way. You have uh, some RAM number generation process that is going to measure some hopefully unpredictable events, such as you know, keyboard uh, presses by user or mouse movements, maybe network or operating system interrupts, this type of thing. And then extract from these uh, measurements some hopefully uniform bits that can then be uh, handed up to some type of application that uh, needs the randomness. So unfortunately, there's been a long uh, academic literature uh, showcasing various ways in which this type of uh, process has failed us. And so I won't uh, talk about all of them. I can just remind, for example, of uh, a uh, particular example that is well known, this Debian open SSL problem that occurred relatively recently in 2008, I guess it's the Bellow 2008, um, where some developer commented out a couple lines of code in the, in the source for Debian, Debian open SSL. And these two lines of code are actually what were responsible for adding entropy from uh, the measurements to the, uh, the entropy pool. So the effect was that the random number generator was just spitting out uh, uh, one or um, a very limited set of possible outputs. And so these are predictable to adversaries. And so in general, there's been um, work showing that failures can really occur at, at many different levels of this process. And perhaps this explains in part why there's been so many failures um, and leading to things like predictable randomness or exposed randomness. And, and as we'll see uh, in the next bunch of slides, repeated randomness as well. So to set a context for this uh, virtual machine uh, reset vulnerability work. We can think of the uh, following type of usage scenario. So you have a home user who has wants to do more secure browsing, and so they uh, turn to uh, handy companies like VMware, who are advertising that if you use virtual machines, you can um, have more secure browsing sessions. Basically, the idea is the isolation guarantees of the virtual machine manager are going to ensure that, you know, say if you get infected with a virus or something, the uh, uh, this won't get uh, escape out from the virtual machine and, and infect the whole system. And so snapshots can actually help facilitate this uh, because uh, of, of the following thing, which I'll just show now. So the idea is you have a home user, and, and, and he has his virtual machine that he can set up. Uh, say he's running Windows or something inside of it. 
say he loads up his internet browser, because this is what he's going to use this virtual machine for. And so at this point, he takes a snapshot. So the snapshot basically is a copy of, of the entire state of the virtual machine, including all the you know, active memory, persistent storage, everything. OK, and so now when he wants to do browsing sessions, he can resume from the snapshot, uh, go uh, surf to some, one of his favorite sites for getting some free software. And in case he made a poor choice of where to visit, and gets uh, you know, exploited by some type of uh, uh, malicious uh, you know, code, the virtual machine you know, ends up getting compromised. But uh, the nice thing is he can reset to the prior clean state of the snapshot to remove all this malware and infection. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is uh, pretty nice. It does actually provide some really improved security in the face of these type of uh, you know, malware attacks. But there's been... Um, a lot of folklore regarding the fact that these type of resets might cause security issues. In particular, for example, Garfinkel and Rosenblum pointed out that hypothetically, of course, you could be replaying some type of security critical state uh, that was saved in the snapshot. If you use it multiple times, this could cause problems. And so I'm just going to refer to this as, as a reset vulnerability. So this uh, exists when multiple uses of uh, the same VM snapshot um, leads to some type of security violation. So even though this has been a folklore problem, no one really uh, knew or had pointed out whether these actually exist in practice. And so that was the, the first contribution to this work, that we showed that uh, these types of resets could lead to random number generation failures. So now uh, consider a situation where you do your first browsing session, okay, and so you actually want to go to a secure website like your bank. So what's going to happen is you're going to use a, a TLS key transport uh, protocol, and Excuse me. Uh, kind of at a high level, what happens is the client here picks a uh, key using its uh, random number generator and sends this key over to the server, and that's used to bootstrap the, the secure session. OK, but the problem is that the next time you resume from the snapshot and go to use uh, TLS uh, uh, to browse some other website, the problem is that the same session, the same uh, key gets chosen in this uh, as well and sent over to the next site. And so this, of course, can be a problem because this is actually all the secret material that's needed to decrypt a transcript of the, the prior banking session. So if, uh, you know, if this other site was malicious, this is a, a big problem. So this wasn't just an abstract problem, but we showed that uh, by you know, checking out experimentally with Firefox and, and Chrome, uh, they actually allow this, this type of problem. Um, in current versions, you know, under a, a couple different virtual machine managers, VMware Server and, and VirtualBox. And so underneath the hood, what, what's happening here is that the, the browser uh, generated some randomness that got captured in the snapshot and used multiple times to generate these session keys. So we went on to look at other settings uh, where this might be a problem. And so we want to look at the other side of, of TLS connections and look at servers. And so we looked at Apache Mod SL, which is the most popular uh, uh, server software for, for uh, TLS. And here we looked at it in a particular mode where you're using the DSA signing algorithm for authentication of the server. And uh, the, we're able to show that uh, what happens is if you resume the server twice from the same snapshot with the daemon running, uh, and an adversary is able to get the first few connections, to the server after this resumption, then you can actually extract the DSA secret key. And so, of course, this is bad because this uh, you know, allows impersonating the server um, and all sorts of, of, of problems. So this might, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I'm just trying to make sure I understand your model. So in your model, when you uh, reset back, do you assume that the random number generator is deterministic from now on? Or do you We're not assuming anything. This is Apache software that right. we downloaded from the internet. So. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry, go ahead. Well, abstractly, I guess, mm -hmm. I'm trying to see, are you, because you're saying there is this randomness, and so here you're not assuming randomness. Is the problem reset, or is the problem bad randomness? In this case, this problem is, is, is randomness being repeated with DSA, and I'll, I'll go into some more details. Um, the, the, the problem with the signing algorithm itself is that if you, and this is well known, you can, I, I kind of worked out with pen and paper, then realized you can just check Wikipedia for this, um, but with DSA, uh, uh, if you sign two different messages with the same randomness, um, and you give some adversary the public key, the two messages, and the signatures, they can just extract the secret key. And that's just the properties of DSA. It's very fragile to, uh, to randomness abuse. 
OK, so how is this actually coming up inside of, of Apache? Well, the easiest way to explain maybe is a kind of a logical timeline of, of events. So first, uh, an administrator launches this Apache daemon inside of the virtual machine. Uh, at this point, uh, Apache software actually forks off a bunch of child processes that are going to be used to handle individual connections. Um, at this point, the ch children processes have their random number generators initialized. So they, they take uh, some, some <coughs> initial randomness from, from dev random or, or some other source. OK, so now the daemon's running, and, and we can take a snapshot and resume later from it. Next thing is that uh, you get a HTTPS request handled. So this is, say, the first request that comes in. And this gets assigned to one of the children processes. And so actually, at this point, the, the Apache does something that uh, is smart uh, or seems smart, which is to update now the sources for the random number generator with, with the current time, um, the child process ID, which is unique to the child process, and actually a portion of the runtime stack of the process. So you're grabbing a bunch of stuff out of memory and sticking it in the source. And then at this point, the RAM is, is taken from the uh, RAM number generator and used with the DSA signing algorithm. So this uh, actually seemed problematic from the point of view of, of actually getting the, uh, an attack to work. Um, in particular, the VM managers we looked at um, synchronized their, uh, their guest time with, with the internet. So you know, if you're running from two different VM snapshots, but they're not at the same time, obviously one's after the other, then this would uh, give you different randomness from the RNG process. So, but when we took a closer look and then played around with some experiments, we actually realized that what happens, uh, at least with the virtual machine managers that we looked at, was that the guest networking would go up before synchronization would occur. And so this actually left a, a window of opportunity to sneak in connection requests by an attacker to uh, try to get two connections uh, that used <coughs> excuse me, um, the same randomness to do the signing. So, So we did some experiments, and this is basically reporting on, on kind of the, a very simple setup where we had um, a snapshot running on a server, and then we would start resuming this uh, snapshot. And then on another computer, we would have a, a, a TLS client just try and rush connections, or not even rush, just connect serially to the, uh, to the uh, Apache server. And then at some point, the, guest net, uh, the, uh, the Apache networking would go up, and a connection request would go through, and so we were basically trying to get the first one. And then we would do this uh, many times. So we would repeat um, uh, um, five different times, I guess, uh, uh, doing this, res resuming from the snapshot and running connections. Then we'd look for, for uh, repeat randomness across pairs of these, these uh, trials. And so, the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I can't remember. For DSA, can you actually test this by ca casually inspecting the signature that randomness has been reused? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, That's exactly what we did, yeah. Yeah, so, you, so the randomness is like the first component of the signature, so you can just look. Um, to see if you were successful, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the, the right column is the most uh, relevant uh, uh, thing. And you know, so VirtualBox, which had very consistent timing, so basically the amount of time from when snapshot would go up to when networking would go up was always the same in each of these, and you'd get the same randomness out. Uh, and VMware was a little bit less so, but still, uh, still had problems. So um, so this kind of brings up some questions about, well, what do we do with, you know, about random number generators in the virtual, virtualized world? What, uh, what type of problems are going on here? So we had this, this initial issue with the browsers. This is a, pro a problem that, you know, kind of solely was happening in the application space that uh, Firefox or Chrome was caching randomness that it was getting, and this was getting captured in a, in a snapshot. But this issue with Apache, which is some type of combination of problems, right? It was, uh, you know, it was trying to reset its uh, RAM number generator with new sources, but those sources, at least the ones that were taken after the snapshot, uh, when, when, a child, uh, when a request came into a child, weren't sufficiently different between runs. So you didn't uh, have enough differentiation. You still had a high probability of, of, of getting the same randomness out. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's actually further problems that we didn't actually completely explore yet. So in the cases you looked at, there's an RNG that's in proc. That is, it's linked into the binary and the executable itself. It's not calling a system call. I mean, they, you said that in both Apache's case and in, and in Chrome, it's calling through. It's getting random out of dev random or dev u random or whatever. Right. Back up. But there's an entropy pool in the application itself. Sure. So this is this is a you know maybe a bit misleading. I'm not trying to say the RNG process here. What I'm what I'm showing is necessarily the the operating systems um, random number generator. 
Um, now, if Apache had actually gone to dev random afterwards, then the, uh, it's not clear whether they would have gotten good randomness or not. And this is actually what was my next point was going to be. But you're right. The, the fact is a lot of applications kind of have their own random number generators internally in, 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 their, in their process, and they're kind of doing their own thing, which is much more of the situation. I, I guess with Firefox, it's very clear they're kind of, you know, Maybe they had initially gotten a good thing, but then after uh, good, good randomness from dev random, but after that, they're just doing their own thing in process space for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but the, the fact is, even if they were always going to the operating system uh, random number generator like dev random, uh, dev random gets rolled back during these resets as well. And so while we, didn't, we haven't explored it fully, um, it's hypothetically the case that you might have uh, not enough uh, um, difference in the sources going into dev random in between a snapshot resumption and when you need randomness from dev random to cause differentiation. Snapshot basically are rolling under people forward. I'm sorry, say that again. Unless you take steps when you make the snapshot. Right, so if you modify how the, the operating system deals with snapshots, that'd be good. But right now, currently, at least in some uh, virtual machine manager situation, they don't actually know that there's a snapshot being taken at all. So the operating system is ignorant of when snapshots occur. And of course, there's this other uh, uh, concern with random number generators in virtualized settings that, that uh, you know, maybe the source events aren't even as good uh, for software-based random number generators as you uh, would, would hope for. Um, and again, this is kind of a, a lurking issue that we didn't really explore uh, fully either. So I often get asked if there's just, you know, aren't there easy fixes to this, right? Can't we just uh, build a good virtual machine managing, uh, a good hypervisor-based RNG? So back up dev random with something the hypervisor uh, knows about maybe we could use something like the next generation Intel chips that have a random number generation instruction uh, built in so you can just call the uh, you know one instruction get randomness from the chip so this would be you know helpful to have such a solid design but unfortunately it's not going to fix some of these problems right first it's it's not going to fix problems that occur in this in the application layer um, because even if you have a good uh, operating system uh, slash hypervisor based RNG uh, if the application is caching things you're still toasted now it should help potentially fix these other types of problems, like with dev random being bad, or, or if Apache had, had, had been configured to go to the operating system uh, on every connection uh, request. And it, you know, it should fix this. But uh, it's unclear um, how to exactly design this. It's a nice, interesting question. And, and furthermore, it's not going to fix all the problems, unfortunately. Yeah? Is there just a race condition here between the time when the, even if you use an RNG instruction, Mm -hmm. You pull it, pull the randomness, then get, then get snapshot. Right. So, so yeah, I, I've kind of glossed over that. So, there, there is this kind of race condition-like element to this. Uh, you know, actually, initial versions of this paper, we we talked about like time of sampling to time of use problems, right? Um, because you can never really achieve atomicity, at least in theory, with snapshots. If they can happen in arbitrary inst instruction steps, then yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so. Hypothetically, yeah, you're never going to be able to solve this problem. But I think from a practical point of view, it's, it's less likely. And so it's not a sure solution, but we should, we should, we should uh, if we, because like, so for example, if you, if you think about when TLS connection requests come in, and if you do the sampling then, it's much less, it's not the fact that you're going to have a TLS connection that, that uh, was initialized before a snapshot was taken and continued afterwards. In, in the type of application scenarios I'm envisioning right now. Now, in the future, that may not be true, that you could keep a TLS connection going you know, uh, through some type of snapshot or replication of a VM. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, basically, this slide is not to be pointing out solutions. It's pointing out that this is a can of worms that needs to be investigated uh, much further, I think, um, for a variety of reasons. So if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to kind of now uh, take a, uh, a, a sharp right turn, maybe, in some sense, and, and try and treat this, this another question that um, our, this previous work kind of raises, which is, why is our cryptographic primitive so, why are our cryptographic primitives so ridiculously fragile to this repeated randomness use? Yeah. So I'm, just, uh, I'm just curious. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I guess a folklore um, solution uh, would be essentially, you know, again, is this reset attacks, would be more or less that you store a key, let's say, for a super random function or something like that. And whenever you know you need fresh randomness, you just take the current state of your applications, like everything that happened so far, and essentially, I mean, maybe more efficiently apply to the random function. So essentially, so even with the reset attack, you reset attack, now you do something different. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so different, you apply PRF, and it's kind of what you're right, right. For the version number of future 
machine. No, but Yuri said, yeah, everything is the same, but then presumably if you do something else, like a different... Yeah, yeah. so, so you're, you're, you're foreshadowing some of the rest of this talk, right? I mean, the, at the end of the day, what we're going to say is, look, we should be changing the cryptographic primitives so that, that they handle this, this, this failure case for the randomness. And so we'll build into the crypto primitives what's going on. Yeah, but the folklore solution is very close to what we were suggesting uh, for practical solutions. Yeah. Just first of all, I think also architecturally, it, 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 it's a good design uh, principle to do it in the crypto government, right. uh, not, uh, not in the current right. Because sometimes you will want to have randomness that you want to repeat. When you don't, or you don't want to always force fresh randomness on the application. Right. Because for debugging, for all kinds of reasons, for, you know, to prove things on the code, you right. really want to be able to redo from the original randomness. Right. Yeah, I think in general we're trying to stress this idea that if you if you make uh, algorithmic changes to the the crypto operations, we can reason about them. We can we can clarify what you're getting out of the changes in terms of the various randomness failure models. Yeah. And so that's what the rest of this talk is going to be about. So. Um, I just wanted to stress for uh, in case it wasn't apparent that you know the, the type of attacks we talked about and some of the other attacks on random number generation failures um, aren't abusing bad randomness during like long lived key generation, right? So. The DSA key was generated with, with good randomness, and, and it was fine. And really, these, this is just uh, a problem with the routine operations and the randomness needed for things like signing or, or key exchange or, or public key encryption. OK. So uh, you know, this is not just a problem with DSA um, or, or, uh, or the key, exchange, key transport mechanism, but you know, lots of cryptographic algorithms have problems right? as soon as you take away the, uh, the good randomness. Uh, and that's, you know, in part because we've been building cryptographic uh, primitives uh, under the assumption that we have good randomness around it and it's, and it's plentiful. And maybe kind of more philosophically even that, uh, you know, for many of our standard um, security goals, uh, you know, it, it, you need good randomness to achieve them, and, and provably so. And, and we'll see an example of this uh, in a minute. So anyway, the, the idea is uh, we want to, you know, fix this. Right now we have... Uh, problems when randomness uh, gets bad. So you have these like, rep repetition randomness to the VM resets. You have even situations where you have predictable randomness, like the Debian uh, situation. And so we're saying, OK, let, let's try and fix this, and, and at least try and make our routine cryptographic operations, the ones that uh, use randomness to do things like signing, key exchange, to be as secure as possible in the face of bad randomness. And unfortunately, we're, yeah? Bad randomness is, is, is different than repeated randomness. Yeah, I'm being rather loose with my terminology here. but. Um, uh, when I say bad, I really mean any lower quality than perfectly uniform, um, and then uh, uh, repeat and predict. I'll try and clarify for particular things. And I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, in the models and stuff anyway. Um, but yeah, bad really means anything except except good, which and good is defined as something that's fresh and uniform and private and never exposed. And so the idea is that okay, we we may not actually be able to achieve our strongest notions of security uh, without good randomness. But that's okay. We won't just give up, and we'll try to uh, define uh, notions and, and meet them that still provide some meaningful level of security. Should the randomness be not as good as we were hoping for? Okay, so I'll do. I'll go through an example of this with uh, public key encryption, which is kind of something easy to deal with and has very interesting um, um, definitional issues actually when it comes to uh, looking at uh, models with uh, degraded randomness. So just to drive the point home, we have a very simple um, public key encryption scheme, right? Like uh, using hybrid encryption with, um, in this case, counter mode encryption. And uh, of course, this is uh, well known to be um, secure under semantic securities, IDCPA. Uh, but uh, you know, when the randomness is bad for uh, repeat randomness, in this case, you can learn quite a bit about messages just from two ciphertexts, right? So if you use the same randomness twice, you end up using uh, the same AS applica uh, application. Um, and you get the same pattern, okay, you can learn the XOR of two messages, for example. If the randomness is totally predictable, um, of course, you can just recover the message uh, immediately, right? Uh, where here, yeah, R is the set of, of, of potential uh, uh, randomness values. Okay, so this is no good. So what, what's going on? Okay, of course, uh, uh, you know, this is probably clear to everybody, but uh, to most people, but I'll go through it quickly anyway. So we have our, our, our traditional public key encryption notion, which is semantic security. And um, uh, so what happens here? Well, you have a challenging environment and an adversary, which is some arbitrary program. So the, the challenging environment picks a random bit, B, and uh, the adversary gets to challenge two different messages. And 
what happens now is that the environment is going to sample R uniformly at random and, and encrypt uh, the one of the two messages based on this challenge bit um, under the public key and give back the ciphertext. And now the adversary tries to guess the bit and, and wins. So um, this, uh, so like I said, this previous scheme, of course, is, is secure uh, under this notion. Um, so what's the catch? Of course, the catch is that the in, the, in our model, we've, we've built in the assumption that the randomness is always good, OK? And so we'd like to remove this assumption, and, or we're going to have to remove this assumption in a model that's going to provide uh, something for us to analyze um, public key encryption when the randomness is no good. So we, uh, in this uh, paper at AsiaCrypt uh, last year, with a variety of, of great co-authors, um, we uh, presented this idea of chosen distribution attacks. And so it actually extends on quite a bit of, of previous work in, in the context of deterministic public key encryption. There's some natural parallels, uh, which are in turn based on some, some previous work on entropic security. And let me just give you uh, a sense of what the, the definition is. So again, we have a challenging environment and an adversary. And uh, again, we're going to choose a random bit B. And now at this point, instead of querying two different messages, the adversary is going to query uh, an algorithm, basically, uh, or what we call a source. And from this, we run it with some fresh private coins, and it outputs uh, some randomness R, and then two messages, M0 and M1. Okay. So now the coins that are used to run this algorithm uh, are hidden from the adversary, but the adversary gets to pick how the uh, distribution of, of R, M0, and M1 um, is, is defined. And so at this point, we encrypt one of the two messages under the randomness that was output by this algorithm and return the ciphertext and the public key to the adversary. And he gets to, again, try and guess uh, the bit. OK, so we're not done yet. There's a lot of other stuff. Uh, one very important issue is that this, we, we can't uh, provide security for arbitrary, um, uh, arbitrary M. So in particular, we need some type of unpredictability of, of the messages and randomness. Otherwise, uh, it's trivial for the adversary to win. So we require that uh, this M must have high min entropy so that the outputs uh, for any, uh, so each pair of outputs RM0 and RM1 are, are unpredictable from the adversary's viewpoint. The connection between, between big M and two, the two little M? Big M, uh, so big M is an algorithm, and it, it, and it gets provided fresh coins. And the output is this, this uh, triple, R, M0, and M1. So you can think of M as, as, um, as a distribution on messages and, and randomness that the adversary gets to pick. Okay? And it's going to get some, fed some private coins, and it outputs uh, what ends up becoming the, the message and randomness that are used with the public key for the, for the challenge cipher text. And PK is derived from R or uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I didn't show. P PK is chosen uh, correctly by the environment. So it, it runs the, the key generation algorithm of the encryption scheme and outputs a public key to your key pair. Uh, doesn't output it. It generates them and, and uses the public key and then provides the public key to the adversary after the challenge. The adversary does CR, of course, right? Uh, does, yes, does not, does not CR. Yeah. I mean, unless C leaks it, in which case you have problems. Yeah. So importantly, he doesn't see PK. PK. He doesn't see PK, yeah, yeah. So this is very, yeah, there's a lot of subtleties to this definition. And in fact, I only showed you a very rudimentary kind of simplification of it. Um, so one thing is that actually, we have to define an M that doesn't output just three values, but actually outputs three vectors of values. And the reason we have to do that is that because in this setting, for uh, the most liberal uh, notion of, of min entropy, um, single message security doesn't imply multi-message security as it does in the, in the randomized encryption case. So it's a bit technical, but the idea is yeah, you need to uh, output vectors as well, so you get back a vector of ciphertext. Uh, this then gives rise to another problem, which is that um, the, uh, which is what we call a quality pattern uh, restrictions. So the fact is, if you're outputting a vector, the, just the uh, equality of ra uh, message randomness pairs is going to be represented in the ciphertext that get output, because the ciphertext will be equal. So the pattern of equalities inside the ciphertext could leak information uh, trivially, and this doesn't really say much uh, in terms of security. So we basically have to have some restrictions saying that the uh, adversary picks an M that doesn't take advantage of the, this fact. So for example, we could uh, assume that, uh, or we could rule out, uh, require that M outputs uh, just unique uh, pairs of R and M values in the vector. So all the ciphertexts end up being unique. Um, there's, uh, we also actually define an adaptive variant. So um, that you can actually query multiple times these, uh, these messages that uh, output vectors. 
And this actually has some very interesting ramifications because of what I'll talk about in a sec, which is the public key issue, um, that if you can query multiple times, this is not equivalent to just querying once with a vector because uh, the encryption scheme could leak some information about the public key, which is problematic in this case if you can define message distributions as a function of the public key. Um, and so as, as Evgeny kind of pointed out, if, if the uh, uh, adversary gets to define message, uh, these, uh, these M samplers as a, defin as a function of the public key, then uh, he can trivially win. And I won't go into the details, but it's kind of a simple thing to, to, to a simple exercise. And uh, so for that reason, uh, at least, uh, this, this definition does not imply IND CPA, our, our traditional notion, which is uh, unfortunate, but uh, seems inherent. OK, so, uh, so in particularly in light of that last fact, that uh, this new definition is not um, stronger than INDCPA, when we target building what we're calling hedge public encryption schemes, we're going to target both goals at the same time. So we want to have something that uh, is INDCPA secure when randomness is good in the traditional sense. And now, additionally, um, is CDA secure. And this provides um, uh, security for a variety of, of randomness failure models. I have a little uh, parenthetical comment here that uh, there was some work uh, by, by one of our co-authors, Scott, but in a separate paper showing an enhancement to INDCPA that kind of knows the, the very particular type of, of randomness failure, which is resets. Um, and there you can do a little bit better than uh, with CDA definition. But I don't want to go into the, the details of it. Um, you can ask me about it later. So uh, in, in this paper, we explored a bunch of different constructions. There's kind of some straightforward ways to go from or some straightforward uh, approaches to go from deterministic encryption to, to hedged encryption. So for example, yeah, yeah, please. What is CDA? Oh, I'm sorry. CDA is this uh, chosen distribution attack security. Yeah, sorry. I should have uh, thrown around acronyms I'm familiar with, but no one else is. Um, yeah, so this is the new definition that we want to achieve. Uh, OK, so we can. Uh, there's like two natural approaches. If you have a deterministic encryption scheme, which is one that doesn't use randomness to provide uh, 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 a, a public key encryption scheme, and you have a randomized encryption scheme, there's uh, you know, two natural approaches uh, based on composition. Now, only one of these is, is secure, as it turns out, uh, under our definition. And so um, don't, don't do this one, I guess. Um, there's another uh, natural approach just using a deterministic encryption scheme, a special type of one, one that uh, ends up being a universal lossy trapdoor function. You can kind of do an even simpler thing, which is just padding out the message with sufficient randomness. Uh, and then you can show that this actually gives you a hedge secure scheme. Um, we went on to, to look at just doing a, now a general framework. So talking about public key encryption, we treated that case. And then this uh, NDSS uh, paper, we, we wanted to say, OK, well, yeah, please, go ahead. So does this capture also this repeated randomness? So, um, so in not entirely. Context. So the, the, the problem is the public key independence issue again. So you can you can. Uh, you can model some forms of repeat randomness, like your message distribution vector could output two, could output vectors that have the same randomness in each one, but, but uniform. Um, and so it captures that, but that's only for public key independent distributions. The definition of, of Yillick uh, actually just takes IND CPA, enhances it, and shows that you can, you can give the adversary additional uh, power to reset, to get encryptions under the same randomness multiple times. And you can actually achieve uh, something that uh, does not have pu just public key independent distributions. So, um, so it is also orthogonal to, to the, the CDA definition, uh, but is stronger than INDCPA. Yeah. Great. Uh, so OK, so we had this idea. So let's, we could just define a, kind of a general framework for uh, hedging you know, arbitrary routine cryptographic operations. This really goes back to the kind of the folklore idea that um, uh, Yevgeny alluded to earlier, that we, we have some operation that has some input, uh, some keys, some randomness. What we're going to do is just run all this through a hedging function to derive new effective randomness for use with the uh, underlying routine operation. Um, and this uh, has a, a number of, of nice properties for, for practical crypto. One, it doesn't impact functionality, so you can immediately deploy it. Um, so for example, on TLS, you can you know, hedge one side of a connection, and the other side doesn't need to know. Um, and, or, or vice versa, or both, which would be even better. Um, so for, for in, you know, in, in the paper, we suggested that you, there's a variety of ways you could uh, implement the hedging function that you have to be a little bit careful. Um, we suggested using HMAC as a sufficiently strong hash function. And the reason is that 
uh, has two, at least two nice properties. One is that when the key is good, when this randomness is good, you get uh, a, a pseudorandom function. And even if the key is bad, then at least you get the, the idea that this HMAC behaves like an ideal hash function and, and gives you uh, uh, something that, that is you know, good enough to be modeled as a, a random oracle in our proofs. So with public key encryption, we can do this. Uh, and then we get this kind of uh, ladder of, of, of security uh, that we get. So under good randomness, you know, if we have our traditional on CPA notion, well, this meets it, and we can get by with a relatively mild assumption on the uh, hedge function. And then when the randomness is repeated, we have to strengthen our assumption a little bit, but then we meet this repeated goal. And then for entirely, uh, so for example, like for the case of critical randomness, we get, um, uh, we can still meet this, but now we have to make uh, the, uh, the random oracle uh, assumption on, on the hedging function. So, but the point we want to emphasize is that, you know, by doing this, you're not degrading really the, the security guarantee you got in the original case. So we're, not, we're not doing any worse than we did before, at the very least. Okay, so you can do this with other primitives. So for example, signing the problem with the DSA attacks that we had before, uh, you can do the same type of thing. And, and here you even, uh, you get uh, yeah similar type of uh, situation. So just to drive it home, of course, if, if hedging had already been implemented, these attacks you know, wouldn't have worked. At least there would have been no uh, catastrophic failure of these, these uh, um, protocols. And so you know, the takeaway is that really hedging, of course, is not going to replace our need for good RAM number generators. But it's going to give us some nice defense and depth properties built into our cryptographic primitives that we can reason about should uh, we have failures, which seem to unfortunately happen all too often. Uh, we went ahead and implemented hedging in OpenSSL um, and you know, ran some numbers uh, and stuff. Uh, it doesn't cost much, I guess, the takeaway. You know, no one's going to notice if you have hedging running more numbers and stuff. Okay, so um, uh, anyway, yeah, just to wrap up, okay, so we saw two things, right? VM reset vulnerabilities and hedge cryptography. Um, VM reset vulnerabilities, right? We're going to have lots of software. We have lots of software out there already that uh, was designed for a world in which you know, virtual machines didn't really exist, or, or at least I should say weren't being used. Uh, and this legacy software isn't designed with things like resets in mind. And um, so when you have uh, this new kind of uh, almost computation model going on in the background that you know, things are getting reset, uh, applications are, are going to break. And, I think the at least people have been thinking very carefully about how to make functionality preserved in this type of new world for a virtual uh, a virtualization. But when it comes to security, people, of course, aren't thinking about this as much. And uh, the concern is that we have these type of vulnerabilities, at least around number generators, and there might be a lot of other problems lurking out there. Uh, and so uh, my sense is that this is a, a big can of worms that uh, we're going to have to deal with. On the other side of the fence, we have the, the hedge crypto. OK, let's let's. Uh, try to make our cryptography behave less embarrassingly in, in the face of bad randoms. Um, it, it, for practical crypto, it can be very fast and, and simple. Um, you know, of course, the catch is that you end up with complicated looking definitions sometimes and maybe uh, relatively complex analyses. But uh, that's OK. Give cryptographers something to do. Um, and uh, yeah, and so the idea is to provide good defense and depth or, or, or graceful de uh, degradation of, of, of security in the face of uh, bad randoms failures. And of course, there's this one uh, kind of open thing to do is to sit back, at least for the case of random number generators, and look back at, at how we should be designing these in, in light of resets. So uh, I'll leave it there and take any questions. More questions, I should say. So this, this notion of hedging can be done instead of any cryptographic primitives, right? That kind of a black box. That's right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean. You can do it to anyone, but you should, you should check what you're doing. And so it, it, there seems like, in general, it seems like it should be um, totally fine. But uh, we, didn't do, we don't have some type of argument saying that no matter what security property you're trying to achieve, hedging will, will you know, not sacrifice it. So in my sense is actually you could find counterexamples that for some cryptographic primitives, if you do hedging, maybe you've done things that you don't like. You can think about things like non-committing encryption or something. Or sorry, wait, non-committing encryption? Committing. Yeah, non-committing encryption would be potentially compromised because you're you're running the randomness through this thing. Um, so it, you can apply it anywhere, but probably you should have people look at each example. Yeah, go ahead. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, and the 90s, there were a favorite of papers on how to take IBM's horrible random number generator and make it do something decent. Have yeah. you checked whether there are any good ideas to speak from there? Or it's not cryptological. I I have not. Um, so what was bad with the IBM one? 
I can explain to you. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's random number generators seem to be something that we haven't gotten right by any stretch of the imagination uh, over the years. So, uh, yeah. I'm curious how far it goes because huh? uh, I'm curious how far this uh, you know hedging goes because conceivably I guess I don't know how slow it would be but you can always like do stuff that you have some currency and whenever some new data comes in you just apply keep applying Merkle Dumbert and when you reset and the new data comes in you will go possibly in a different direction so essentially it's like uh, I'm suggesting implementing some kind of iterative PRF like uh, some kind of Merkle Dumbert so that, you know, so you're basically uh, saying you maintain some state. He says we maintain some fresh state, which uh, where you know the, every next whenever there is some new data, which is you know particular to your application, you will update the state. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you're right in the sense that if, as long as you're careful to stick all the same type of inputs that we're sticking in the hedging here into the stateful thing, you're good. But I feel like stateful is just going to make things more complicated to deal with. This is why I'm saying, I mean, it, it seems... It's not clear you're getting any efficiency speed up there either, right? What, what's the... Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's, uh, it's not efficiency, it's uh, right. essentially, it seems like if you want to get as bulletproof thing in the presence of reset attacks, mm -hmm. uh, that's the way to go. When you say application kind of specific randomness, presumably the problem will be that when the attacker asks like a different message, you reuse the same randomness. Here, no, the moment you change the message, the randomness will also, you know, because intuitively you're not saying that we have bad runs. You, have, you say you have good randomness, but due to reset, right. it might repeat. Yeah, yeah. Whenever new stuff comes in, like a new message comes in, you use new randomness for the signing. So yeah, essentially, kind of maybe, but maybe build it all, almost to the system level kind of thing, that whatever the recent state of the application, right. it's required. So the, yeah, so, so yes, you could uh, rebuild your random number generation process inside applications, just have a PRF key lying there, and then they, they, hash, they run it over things. But the question is, you have to be careful about what things you stick into it, right? Um, um, because there could be corner cases. I don't have great examples. I have some like anecdotes that you know, if you put too much stuff into it, adversarially controlled things, you might be affecting other security properties elsewhere. So if you kind of take it out of the crypto primitive, uh, it's hard to do the analysis um, if, if system designers kind of throw things in. So one of the things is if we do hedging in the primitive, we can kind of like just do it, and then not people don't have to be the wiser, right? And we, we can do the analyses. Uh, I mean, I'm actually suggesting something maybe or maybe on the operating system level which has both features so essentially your application whenever you design a process you have an option to specify you know periodically the next batch of application specific data uh -huh. which you want to be used to mix randomness so maybe so, I mean, you essentially have that type of API now with random number generators right you can have an application say here to the open SSL random number generator here here's a bunch of application specific stuff that I want you to mix into the pool but, I mean, but it's not clear people do this, uh, and it's not clear it's always the right thing to do, necessarily. I mean, you have to be careful, that's all I'm saying. It could be okay. Um, whereas the hedging thing, uh, it, you know, it's simple because we can look at it in the context of the cryptographic algorithm, and that's, that's the, the takeaway benefit, I think. Yeah? So, assume that you have a hardware RNG. Yes, I'm switching. assuming that, yes. Mm. It, it, and because now I'm assuming that. Well, because I'm thinking about this in the Windows context, right, uh -huh. where you're looking at VM snapshots, but it's actually not that much different than saying, I've got a bunch of identical machines that I'm going to power on equivalently in a data center. Right. Okay. Independent of the VM sort of issue. The VM's just if I push this data out and get out of the state. So um, we've certainly noticed issues with energy across the machines. One way we fix that is you put TPMs in them and you scrape the TPMs early and often. Right? That gives you some hardware to fix it. So presumably now you guys are going to move to the you use Intel chips, you're just going to use the hardware instruction? Or? If that's there, it depends on, I mean, we'll take advantage of anything. We have, okay. a, we have a model where we'll take entropy from a variety of hardware sources. Okay. Okay. So, you know, more and merrier. Um, if I, and then there's a case that you didn't explicitly highlight, but I think it's related, which is that generally when you power down and reboot a machine, there is a save of the pool, right? Mm -hmm. right. And then that's, a, that's similar to a, a snapshot. You have to do some protection there to effectively roll the pool forward. Uh, it's, not, it's not exactly the same as duplicating a snapshot, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you're still moving forward always in time. You generally move forward. Yeah. When you do a VM boot up, you either mix in from your hardware mm -hmm. at that point in time when you bring the snapshot back, mm -hmm. or if you know that when you save the snapshot out, mm -hmm. you roll the pool. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's ways that you could defend against this at the OS level. That's true if your application is playing ball, right? The, the problem is that the application needs to make sure it's not. Uh, so these are cases where the application, where I'm assuming that the OS provides a system RNG, 
<laughs> right. So I think we would go a long ways if we had a, a nice and, and like you know cryptographically sanctified or whatever uh, approach to doing um, the v uh, the, the random number generator from the operating system the VMM support, right? So even if you have all that, which I agree, that's going to go a long ways to helping the situation. You still need the applications to use it correctly. Just you know the same problem we've always had with random number generators: applications need to use it correctly. That is that the apps are putting their own RNGs into their apps as opposed to calling the system certified one. Well, I don't know. I mean, the thing is when I and I'm not positive what the design rationale is between behind like uh, I'm not positive what the design rationale is, but my suspicion is like for things like Firefox, you know they they grab randomness at, at, at boot up time because it's, it's inefficient to grab randomness otherwise. Maybe this goes away if you have an Intel instruction that's very quick to give you randomness. Um, but anyway, they want to do this for efficiency, so they cache it before the next connection request goes out because they want to optimize. That's like on the critical path, right? So they thought they could take random number generation out of the critical path. What we're saying with snapshots of the application layer, you need to put it back in the credit, critical path you know, for, for this type of thing, like, like a browser a TLS request. Um, so, but, but you're 100% right. Like we need, we need to, to get good RAM number generators built into the operating system and the virtual uh, and the VMM and have hardware backup, uh, hardware sources. And, and then it's just a matter of making sure applications are doing the right thing, which I think in, includes kind of updating cryptographic best practices about saying, you know, you, need, you can't do random number generation grabbing like, you know, four days ago and then use it later. I mean, you need to really kind of put it in the critical path thing. How much of this problem is because the applications you looked at are effectively implementing their own RNGs in Brock? As opposed to, and therefore they're caching, they're, they're pulling state out of the system dev random, or dev e random, if they want something wrong, right? But they put right. that up, and they're then doing their own RNGs as a second. It's error. an open question. It's an open question. So you're right. I think the attacks as is would not work if you hit dev, dev random every time, even without a good VMM backed up uh, dev random. Um, uh, but it, it's not clear you, it's not clear you're secure still. I mean, it may be that you still have some probability of having a repetition. Because it depends on what the sources are going to dev random at that point. Now, if you replace dev random with something that's VMM backed up, and you're hitting dev random right before the application uses the randomness, then you're probably OK, except for this kind of nagging theoretical issue that there's, it's not atomic, right? It's not that the app is doing its own RNG. It's that the app pulled some randomness a little well, long I, before it used it. No, technically, well, no, right. right. I mean, so so the, these are, the, some of them do, they have their own RNG like in logic inside the application, and, and some of them go to dev random sometimes to refresh it. But let's, but, let's just no, say, so let's I'm just, that's what exactly what I'm saying. Hypothetically, if they always went to dev random, it would be better, but I'm saying that wouldn't fix. Uh, Even so, if you had so, a gap between the two. No, but look, right. look at what happens on Windows, okay, as a, as a counter to this, right? Mm -hmm. So you call into the SSL stack, that's a common system sort of thing. That calls down into, into the RNG inside of the cap, right? And in fact, there's a fan out down there, and I've actually got eight of them for performance reasons that kind of wrap around, and I've got state inside there. There's a, that state, so if you've got RNGs that are a system function, right? You have to worry about whether or not that gets persistent, okay? And where, and where when you spin those up, when you bring the OS up, where do they pull entropy from? So the question is, where's the entropy pool that your system, I mean, it's a matter of, you've got an RNG, there's an entropy pool backing it, who pulls entropy from that? It's system. not just who, but when, right, when. is the question. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that, that if you snapshot it, do you detect that properly, and do you effectively mix something else into it so that you avoid but, the duplication? But, but once the randomness has been pulled from the pool to the app, right. there's this time, there's this gap between. Sure. So the question becomes then, is the app pulling randomness from the pool right before it's being used or holding it on, on, on it before? And, 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 and is it deriving any further from it? Right. Yeah, so I mean, what he's saying is sometimes they pull it from, from, the, uh, from the operating system and then they use that as like a PRF key. Yeah. I mean, it's the, cool. but the I mean, either way, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's a, the, I mean it's a, can't, there's kind of problems at a lot of different levels. And, I, and maybe I didn't do the best job of, of clarifying that there's like problem A, B, and C. I mean, there's like a bunch of problems mixed together here. Um, but uh, in any case, we need to figure out how to do good random number generation VM mem settings. And then we need to educate application design mm -hmm. about uh, proper use in the, case, in, the, in the context of resets. Um, and actually doing that, it's easy, easy to say that, but doing it is probably a lot harder. Yeah. Well, sorry, well, I guess maybe you shouldn't take too much time, but yeah, essentially, no time I'm just saying, my, no, my suggestion very quickly is just instead of just calling, whenever you need randomness, you just call dev random with no inputs, just call dev random with an optional application specific input, and then the operating, so that the user doesn't have to know about PRFs or something. It says, you know what, maybe there is some reset, I'll just call dev random with an optional user specified input. And the operating system guarantees that if the seed was good, even if it's repeated, it will incorporate my input. That's all I'm suggesting. That shouldn't be that uh, if, the, if the seed was good, then well, sorry, the what's the guarantee that the user, that So I'm the user. Mm -hmm. The only extra interface I want, instead of just calling dev random and using randomness myself, 
So I, need, I might need to know about random functions or something. I just call that random with an optional argument, which is something user specific, maybe a message to be signed or whatever, and then I'm guaranteed that the randomness I get is going to incorporate my optional input. So I mean, that doesn't. So that that might be one solution, but that I mean, that doesn't change the three things I said you need to do, right? And what you're suggesting there requires application changes, right? So no, no application changes. No, no, the application oh, needs to change. do this, right? Because yeah. you changed the API. To oh yeah, the but different. that's a trivial change, right? Yeah. 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 So you have to change all the applications used at random, right? So which which may not be. It's an optional argument, right? So if it's you know you take an existing application, if uh, you know you compile yeah, but, but it, it's not yeah. But if we want security, then you can't. I mean, you have to make sure it's yeah. not. Optimal. No, but I'm just saying the operating system change. I'm surprised why the random doesn't take user specify argument. I think there's a host of reasons, but you would have to ask someone who designed the APIs. Yeah, I think I'm way over on time, so thank you. Yeah, let's take the speaker. All right, next speaker is Christoph Piacek, speaking on subspace LWE. Christoph is from CWF. Okay, can you hear me? So I will speak about something which actually honestly has nothing to do with the cloud, but I will talk about it anyway. So it's about the learning with errors problem. So here's a short outline of the talk. I will first define the learning with errors problem and the less general learning parities with noise problem. Then I will show you, an, this is a non-adaptive hardness assumption. Uh, then I will show you an adaptive assumption, which just has the term subspace in front of it, and actually prove, give a short proof that those two assumptions are equivalent, the original one and this adaptive one. And then I'll show some cool, cool applications of this, uh, of this new assumption. Okay, so what is the learning parities with noise problem? This is a problem that comes, has, has a long history. It has been looked at by people from learning theory and so on. And it's defined very simply. So you have like some person uh, who has access to a black box. This black box, this black box has some uh, random bit string of length n inside it and some parameter between zero and one half. And then the, the, the person can just ask, give me a sample. And what this box does is it samples a uniform random bit string of length n it samples an error with, with Bernoulli distributions with parameter tau. This means this is a random variable which is zero with probability. Uh, sorry, this is a random variable which is one with probability tau and uh, this bias towards zero. And then what this box outputs is, yeah, this random r and the inner product, so bitwise, uh, bitwise, uh, multiplica bitwise multiplication with r and the secret s, plus added this little bit of noise to it. And yeah, we will say that so this learning parities with noise problem is hard, so parameterized by this uh, length of the secret n, the number of maybe samples that the adversary does, this para noise parameter tau. We say it's S epsilon hard if you're at the advantage of any adversary of outputting actually the secret is upper bounded by epsilon. So this is the computational version of the LPN problem. You can also define a decisional version. So in this case, we have an adversary who has either access to the box that I just described or to a box which actually does adds uniform random error to this thing. So actually the entire string is a uniformly random. And then we say, OK, this problem is hard if uh, the adversary has at most advantage epsilon and distinguish these two cases. And in fact, this decisional and computational version have been shown to be a polynomial equivalent. OK, that's the learning parodies with noise problem. It has been generalized by uh, Reg F in 05 to a problem that is called learning with errors. Again, we have like a secret, but it's now not a bit string, but like a string of elements in ZQ. And we uh, have not just the error parameter tau, but like some distrib error distribution g, which outputs, uh, so this, this, this is a distribution over elements in, uh, in ZQ. What is used actually in this assumption is something that is called a discrete Gaussian. So it's like an error distribution. It looks like a Gaussian. And this has like a small variance, like I think square root of q or something is uh, what you usually use. OK, the, distribution, uh, the game is the same. We sample a random r in ZQ. Uh, we sample the error according to this distribution, and the adversary can ask for arbitrary many samples. And again, we say that this problem is hard if you cannot distinguish. And again, the decisional version is you cannot uh, distinguish this distribution here from uniform from a box that just gives uniform random stuff. Okay, why is what is known about this problem? So, you know, this, as I said before, the decisional and computational versions are the same. And from now on, I will always talk when I talk about the LPN or LW. I will always uh, talk about the decisional version, so the strong version where you ask to distinguish random from uh, from these samples. Uh, the learning parities with noise. Yes, you not. Uh, are the decisional and computational versions equivalent for any modulus, or is it? Uh, um, so as. So the, so the LPN is, 
this model is too, and I think I don't really know what regf shows. Chris knows that probably better. Prime polynomial Q or smooth Q. That's KSS. What's KSS? Ah, uh, that's. I took this from Regev's overview on uh, learning with errors. This is, let's see, um, I think Kalai. And we some. That's actually, so Regev attributes it to, uh, to this paper. Okay, maybe it's a typo of my side. Okay. I'll look it up. Smooth key, though. Okay, so there are, okay. It's, it's equivalent for appropriate choices. Of, <laughs> so, yeah. It, Okay, um, so in the like a cool. So okay, so the LPN problem is known to be uh, equivalent to decoding random linear, linear codes. This is the average case hardness assumption, and uh, what's cool about the LWE assumption is uh, so when this rare distribution is something called a discrete Gaussian, this problem has been shown by Regev to be as hard as worst case lattice problems. So this is. Uh, Okay, so, and these problems, the LWE and the less general LPN problem have been used in cryptography a lot. So LWE has been used, so for one thing, because it has this extremely cool uh, hardness guarantee, and for another thing, it has turned out to be extremely versatile for crypto. So, so Chris and Vinod and other people have built pretty much any primitive you can think of from LWE, like, yeah, public key encryption, IBE hype, and I know what signatures, and so on. <coughs> The LPN problem is less versatile, so it's uh, so there is something like it's less versatile for for doing crypto, but it, it still has found usages because it's extremely efficient because you just basically do bit bitwise uh, taking in a product that's extremely fast. So you might have heard about this authentication protocols due to Hopper and Plum. I will come to this later. Okay. So, so, I've, so this LWE problem is uh, is a non-interactive hardness assumption. You just get samples, you distinguish. Okay, now let me define a, a new hardness assumption that I will call subspace LW, which is the, now an adaptive hardness assumption. So now the adversary actually can interact with this box. The box, again, is parameterized, so has some secret of length m in ZQ. Moreover, it's parameterized, again, an error distribution G, and moreover, some parameter n, which, has, which is less than, than m. I will come in a minute to what this, this m has to do. What the adversary now can do is he can ask a query to this box, not just give me the next sample, but actually the adversary can choose two uh, two, uh, pro two affine projections, uh, VR and VS. Uh, so technically, this is the, the VR is, for example, given by a M times M matrix XR. So this is to, to, you know, to, to the linear projection, and it's affine, so you can have this little XR to, to add something to it. Same for uh, VS. And what the adversary gets back is now the following. As before, the, the box samples a random R, the error distribution G, but it gives back, so this random R, and the inner product, not of R and S, plus the error as before, but like it first uses phi R to project R to whatever phi R defined. It projects S to whatever phi S defined, and then it takes the inner product of this, uh, these two projected values. Okay. Um, what is this? Oh, yeah, okay. This is the definition of the affair and fine things. Okay. So basically, we can define like a hardness assumption. So okay, look, this this uh, this problem, this M M T C sub uh, S L W problem is is hard if uh, if no adversary can distinguish this. And I should say something more. Ah, okay, yeah. What? Can you repeat again? What it is that the adversary chooses? Yeah, I forgot to say something more. The adversary chooses this matrices X R. Big X R, small X R, uh, big X S, small X S, which define projections of R and S. And there is one constraint to this choice. He cannot choose this arbitrary, because if he can do this, this is obviously trivial, this problem. One, one second. Because I, the other story could just protect on the first coordinate of S, ask many samples, and with the little error would, you could cancel it out, you would learn it. So I put an additional constraint, and this constraint is that this project, this phi R and phi S, overlap in a sufficiently, project in a, overlap in a sufficiently large subspace, and I require that the subspace is at, has dimension at least m, which formally means the rank of xr and xs has to be at least n. But otherwise, the adversary can do what he wants. So for example, X, I will show you a natural example what xs and xr can be. For example, he can just take a subset of size n of the, of, of the, of the element, or fix all of the bits of r except n positions. Yes, Vino? So xr and xs are, let's assume for a minute that little xr and little xs are zero. Yeah. So that's okay, right? 
uh, and big XR and XS are public or are they you know? So the, this is the input to the box. The adversary adaptively chooses this as inputs. He chooses this as inputs, asks, gets stuff back. Chooses adaptively new XS, XR, asks the box, gets a new sample back, and so on. Restriction all of them, so somehow it should restrict, restrict. Yeah. So, he, so the, the restriction is only on each pair independently? Yeah, of each pair independently. When he chooses these two X, XXR, they have to overlap in a sufficiently large subspace. Okay. Okay. But, but the noise is, is, is just the input random at each time? The r noise is as before. The noise is exactly as in the original LW. So the, yeah, the, the with each, with each, right. exactly. It's not the same noise? It's not the same noise, no. It's like the LW. Yeah, you know? So that case, the inner product of VR of R and K of S is basically the inner product of R and S, right? I mean, in which case? Uh, so the inner product of we get the X, we get the XRT XS in between. When what? I see. So uh, so when XR and XS are identity, so identity matrices, and XR XS are zero, you're back to the standard. Uh, okay. All right, so let me say a few things to clarify this. It's one, one thing is completely trivial. So uh, if this, this, this adaptive thing is hard, then this immediately implies that the standard LB fast. So this is the trivial direction, and this is very easy to see. Why? Because, okay, assume I, I, assume I, have, an, uh, I have access to this uh, MN subspace LW oracle. Then I can, uh, and I have an adversary who, who breaks, breaks this hard, this assumption to uh, advantage epsilon. Then I make you an, ad uh, an adversary against the standard LVE assumption, which uses secrets of length n, which is the dimension of the subspace that, uh, that I have to project into, in a very simple way. I just choose the inputs. I always choose the same inputs to this, to this adapt to, to, to my subspace LW oracle. And this input is simply this: xr and xs are zero. And the projection that I use is I just use the identity matrix in the first uh, n diagonal entries, and the rest is zero. What happens? Okay, what happens is that I get the inner products of this form, but look, this x r times r this just deletes out everything of r except the first n positions, and this deletes everything everything out except the first uh, first n positions. So what you get is basically the inner product of like a prefix of S with so you have exactly the same you have exactly the same distribution as with the normal LW assumption that uses as a secret a substring of, of S which just contains the first element. So this direction is trivial. If the subspace is hard the so if uh, if the subspace assumption is hard using secrets of length M that where you have to project the two dimensions N, this is as hard as the if this is hard then also the standard assumption is hard. So the interesting thing is that the other direction is also true, basically. So if the, this N, the standard problem with secrets of length N is hard, then also this uh, subspace LW problem uh, that maps into, into subsets of, into, uh, into, into, into subspaces of dimension N is also hard. And what do we lose? Okay, so the, the, the size of the, of the adversary is considered you don't lose anything. And did the, so this, this epsilon here is the error of the subspace. And this epsilon here is on the standard LW. It's the same. But plus something that depends on the on the dimension of uh, of the uh, that depends on the dimension of the so on that Q on, on the elements that you use. Okay, this is maybe good enough if Q is exponential or very big, super polynomial, uh, but not if Q is say two for LPN. But fortunately, we can do a little bit better. So if we uh, take a gap between these dimensions that we require, so I want that you map into dimensions of n plus d, where d is, I don't know, 50 or something, then this problem is actually as hard as the LW assumption of dimension n. And you only get an additional factor in the error, which is like exponentially small in, in d. So the q to the d. q is the size of the field in d. So if you, if you choose this gap big enough, depending on q that you need, then you have a, this shows us those things are basically equivalent. Okay. And, and I'm saying the same thing. Uh, maybe a more clean way to say it, you can say for any delta, you, know, you will get epsilon prime is epsilon plus delta, but then you would put n plus log one over delta. I mean, this is like more consistent with how kind of abstract. But I'm just saying, m, you, you will say for any delta, this thing is epsilon prime is equal to epsilon plus delta as long as you set n prime to be n yeah. plus log one over delta. Anyway. You could, yeah. yeah. It's for applications, it might be a clean okay. Okay, so why, what does this imply? 
So before I show you a new construction, what, what does this, the fact that this uh, subspace LWE samples are hard? So I said to you before that there are tons of applica uh, applications of this LWE and LPN assumptions. So in many of these assumptions, they use the fact that the samples are pseudo-random that you get from the LWE oracle. But what happens, for example, so exactly so this, okay, this is what the SLWE cases gives you. What, for example, what happens, for example, if now we have this application that whose hardness relies on, on, you know, on, on the hardness of LWE, but somehow the adversary can kind of fix a few, few bits of, the, of this random vector R. So the application has to fix the random vector R, but maybe the adversary can control this source. It's like a bit fixing source, eh? So the element can, can fix all the elements of R except N elements. So this, um, uh, because the subs this is going to be as hard as the subspace LWE problem of dimension n, so you have secrets of length m, the, advers uh, the adversary can fix all the bits except an element, so, and because this is as hard as the uh, SLWE problem of dimension n, your primitive will stay secure even if the adversary can fix all bits. Okay, you, you degrade in security, you basically fall back to the security that is guaranteed by the LWE assumptions with secrets of length n instead of m, but you're still safe. So caveat here is, we still have this error vector, which also has to be random, and you cannot tamper with this. So if, if, if anything goes wrong with the randomness for the error, uh, you, you're dead. But in many cases, for example, the HB protocol that we will see later, you, the, the, this randomness is sent over a channel, and maybe the adversary can tamper with it and like set a few bits, but not everything. And this, this basically implies that you're still safe, even if, if this happens. Another thing is our key, uh, relate, something that's called related key attacks. So in a related key attacks, you, you have a crypto system that has a secret S. And what you can do is, uh, if you, maybe you can somehow change the secret. Maybe it's a smart card, you can put it in a microwave, flip a few bits or something. You can somehow change the secret and then actually uh, invoke the, the crypto primitive with this slightly tampered secret. So assume, for example, what you can do is you have this, again, the primitive that is uh, based on the LW assumption, and you have the secret key is actually, yeah, the secret S used, used, uh, used for LW. And maybe the adversary can somehow set the elements of, uh, of S. He can set all, uh, almost all elements, but like, well, he can set all elements, but maybe not, not N of them. So N of them will always be uh, the original ones. And yeah, the hardness of S LW, uh, subspace LW implies that this is still gonna stay hard, as hard as the, standard LW problem with secrets of length. So these are just to illustrate like two particular examples uh, of what such uh, subspace LW oracle allows you to do. Yeah, not all the same no, no, it says F can fix all but uh, N elements of, uh, of the secret. So how is it related to your paper? Here you show that when you one fixed distribution on S which has high entropy, and here you're saying you restrict distributions to be the subspaces in some span, uh, sense, but you allow the adversary to change it, right? So, the, the, so this LW assumption has been proven to be extremely resilient to leakage. Yeah. So if you have a secret S that stays, the secret stays always the same, you leak something and then it's there good. So this is, you this shows, it's, it's, a, it's a completely orthogonal thing. This shows it's resilient to tampering. Not so one is against leakage, this is resilient to tampering. It's, here you actually change the secret and do another thing. You don't leak anything except what you get from access, but you actually tamper with the secret. Okay. Okay, so let, let me give the proof, steps, a proof sketch of this, of, this, of this theorem that I said before, that, uh, that okay, if, if the LW problem is hard, then also the subspace LW problem is hard. So what, what's the challenge here? So the challenge is here, we have access, what we have to do is we have, we have uh, access to LWE oracle that gives you samples of this form, so some secret S of length N, samples uh, random vectors R, adds error, and so on. And you have to show how to transform this, so to prove this theorem, we have to show how to transform these samples into samples of this form, where this x r and x s are adversarially chosen with every with every sample. So for every sample, we have to do this transformation. And for all these samples, this s hat has to stay the same. It doesn't. It has to be random and stay the same, used in all the samples because it stays the same in the in the assumption. And this r hat has to be uniformly random in every every new sample. Okay, how do we do that? So that's the transformation. How you transform this s into this s hat? Of course, if you say that the transformation, you don't actually do this in the reduction because you don't know S, but that's what you, that's how you, what you do is the following. You sample a random matrix R, the M times N matrix, some blinding vector B, and you define this new S hat to be R times S plus B. You don't know what S hat is, you don't know what S is, but you will, you will generate samples of this form using this sample S hat. Okay, how do you sample this R hat? Okay, that's how you do it. 
So you, this, is a, this is a set. This is the set of solutions to this equation. So you have this. These are all y's. That satisfy, so these are the inputs from the adversary. This is the r that you chose here. This is also inputs from the adversary. Again, again this r. This is, this is the r that you get from the LWL, uh, LWE sample. And you just sample this r hat randomly from all solutions uh, to this equation. And this set is actually non-empty if the rank of this matrix xr times this s times r is at least n. And actually, you can show, you know, if, if the rank of this here is at least n plus d, which, which you were guaranteed because that's that we require from the adversary that he only chooses uh, matrices that have rank n plus d, and this r is uniformly random, you can actually show that the probability that this has rank less than n is at most basically 2 divided by q to d plus 1. OK, and then because you use t samples, you have this uh, t up here. OK. OK, and now, OK, I showed you how to sample uh, this r hat. I still have to say how to sample this entire big thing. So the error e here will be exactly the same error as you have here. And that's how you sample it, basically. So this term here, that's this term here, is basically the term you get from the LWE sample plus some z, z that you can compute from values you know, and that's the z that you have. So uh, you know everything. You, you know r hat, you know these values from the adversary, this b you have chosen yourself, and so on. And you do some linear algebra, I can prove that this has perfectly the right distribution. So that's the reduction. OK, that's, that's the first part. Yeah. OK, that's the first part of the talk. And now I come to an application. So I showed you that this uh, subspace LW assumption has like nice applications in terms of you know, bit, it, it immediately implies security against like bit fixing uh, sources or some classes of related key attacks for all existing uh, existing schemes that are based, whose security is based on the LWE assumption, on the pseudo-randomness of these samples. But you can also, once you know that this thing is hard, you also can come up with completely new protocols. So I will show you an authentication protocol. So what's an authentication protocol? So consider a protocol where we have, uh, uh, so it's a symmetric authentication protocol. We have like some, uh, some, some, uh, some prover and some verifier, this is sometimes called tag and reader, whatever, they share some, so it's a symmetric setting, they share some secret key, they communicate a little bit, and uh, at the end of the communication, this reader says, okay, I, I accept or reject. And of course, the idea is somebody who doesn't know the secret, uh, secret and interacts with this, uh, with the verifier shouldn't, shouldn't be able to make the verifier accept. And there are many different notions for, uh, for the security of these authentication attacks. That the weakest one is so-called passive security. So here you consider an adversary who, like in the first phase, can observe arbitrary many commu uh, communication transcripts between this uh, uh, prover and the verifier, including the final decision of, uh, of, the, uh, of the verifier, if he accepted or not. So usually he should always accept, but maybe with a small uh, completeness error. And in the second phase, then the adversary interacts only with the, with the verifier. And he tries to make him accept, and you say, okay, the adversary wins if he actually can make the, this, this, uh, uh, this prover accept. A stronger notion uh, is so-called security against active attacks. Here, the adversary also can first like, observe as many samples as he wants, but additionally, the adversary can actually interact with, this, uh, with the prover. So he can send ch challenges or whatever to the prover and see, see what answers this, uh, this uh, this verifier gets not only not only like randomly chosen uh, challenges from the from the from the verifiers normally and again the second phase is the same, okay and the ideal notion that you usually want to have from this and the strongest notion is of course security against man in the middle attacks so here you consider an adversary who sits in between the reader and the verifier he can arbitrarily s interact with those maybe schedule the messages how he wants maybe concurrently and so on and okay. You know, you can talk to many provers in parallel, kind of. Which is, I, I don't think it's a favorite. With the pattern. same secret, or? No, no, I mean, you, uh, the attacker, you, yeah, the provers independently talk to you. Yeah, the provers have the same secret. You just have independent yeah, you sessions. Prob so yeah, you This is cut shin paper, right? I mean, yes, you can have concurrent executions on, yeah. Because I think standard security, even the professional will not work for this, right? No, so, anyway, but yeah. this is the strongest, yeah. So. So, I mean, actually, it's trivial to achieve this kind of security if you have, like, a PRF or something, or even a Mac or so. So this is, uh, you just, you know, this, the, the, the prover sends you a random challenge. You ex uh, evaluate the PRF on that input, and you're done. But what we are doing this, what, what I will do now is to try to get, like, authentication protocols which are, like, extremely efficient. So basically, they just should use a few uh, XORs and ANDs. And what we will achieve is only this active security. 
So this, uh, and it's actually open how to do efficient authentication from, from LPN. So you can do uh, that is secure against men in the middle attacks. You can, it, you can do it because it's a pseudo random generator. You can use GGM and then you have a PRF, but that's not efficient. So when I say efficient, what I mean is basically K times N basic operations where K is some parameter that uh, such that the LPN assumption with secrets of uh, length K is secure and N is some statistical security parameter, 100, so K times N XORs or ANDs, that's what they allow. That's efficient. Okay. Um, so there is a famous protocol uh, due to Hopper and Bloom. So they, they propose this protocol actually as a very uh, authentication protocol that even humans can, uh, can compute. So even if you have like a piece of paper with your secret, you actually can do this in your head or on a piece of paper. And uh, do this. so how does the protocol work? So the verifier and the prover share a secret S. The verifier chooses a random A, sends it over, and the prover sends basically back the in, so the, the, uh, this LPN sample. So S in the product of S and A plus this some error E. And the verifier checks if what he gets from, uh, from the prover is really the inner product of S and A. Of course, uh, this, has, this has a very big soundness error, uh, sorry, correctness error, because you know, uh, the verifier will only accept with probability 1 minus tau, so something more than 1 half. So let's say if tau is 0 0.25 with probability 0 0.75. And it also has a, a huge... Um, uh, so this was the completeness error. It also has a huge soundness error because if I just send a random random bit, I, the, the, the verify will accept still with probability one half. But uh, you can amplify this. So you can uh, cut and shin have shown. Yeah, you can you can do this in parallel, like n times, where n is a statistical security parameter, and, and you're safe. Okay, so that's what I just said. And this protocol is secure against passive attacks, so this weakest notion that I showed you before, and it's trivially insecure against active attacks. And why is it insecure against active attacks? It's easy to see. So assuming, so in an active attack, you can't query the prover in the first phase. So you just send him A's where, say, the first bit of A is 1 and all the other bits are 0. You get basically noisy inner products of S times A, uh, S times A, where A is like this, which basically is the first bit of S plus some error. And if you get enough samples, you can, you, you, it will be biased towards the first bit of S, and you've learned the first bit of S. Then you do this with the second bit of S, and so on, and you learn it. Okay, so uh, subsequently, like Jules and Weiss have uh, proposed a protocol that is called HP Plus and achieves active security. So what they basically do is they add an additional third round. So in the first round, actually, the prover chooses a random B and sends it over to the verifier. From then on, okay, as in the HP protocol, the verifier chooses A, sends it back. Then you, then you pro, uh, compute this here, so the inner product of some secret S1 with B, some secret S2 with A, add the error, and again, the thing is as before. This is secure against active attacks, but not against men in the middle attacks. It has three rounds. And uh, let me see. OK, that's the protocol again. And uh, it breaks. OK, and that's a very, very cute security proof that I will go through in for a few minutes uh, due to cats and shin. So they show the following. So assume I have an adversary A who breaks this active security of this protocol with advantage epsilon. So this adversary expects first access to some, uh, to some prover P. And I do the, I, so I run this adversary and I do the following. I choose S2 myself. I have access to some LPN oracle, which either gives me LPN samples or uniform random junk. And OK, whatever I get from the oracle, I send to A. This made, like, I get like N samples with the, the randomness. I concatenate them, send them over to uh, the adversary. The adversary sends me back some matrix A. I send uh, this answer here to the, to the adversary, which is computed as follows. OK, I know S2, so I compute A times S2, where this is the A I got from the verifier. And this X is whatever I got from my oracle. So these are the, the, the elements which are either random or, yeah, all these noisy in the products that I got from the oracle. In the second phase, OK, now the adversary is on the left side, and, uh, uh, and he has to, to, to uh, and we know that he has advantage epsilon in actually making the, the verifier accept. So what you do is the adversary sends us B. We send the adversary back some random A1, and he gives us some Z1. But of course, now we can't compute anything because we don't know S1. So we cannot check if this is a valid answer or not. What we do is we rewind the adversary uh, to this first phase and send him a new, a different A2 and a different Z2. And now assume that, in fact, in the second phase, both this Z1 and Z2 would, the, 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 the prover verify would have accepted both of these Z1s, which means the Z1 and Z2 are of this form, where this E1 has low weight. Okay, if I add them together, then this B times S1, which is the same 
I rewind it, but I only rewind it to this point, so we have two times the same b, it will cancel out. What I get is, okay, imagine here is equality, not a, not a plus, and here a plus, so I, what I get is this here. So I take this term on the other side of the equation, and what I get if I just, okay, these terms I know, S2 I know, so I add this to this term, oh sorry, I add this to this term, I get like the sum of these two low weight vectors. And okay, if, if I, what I get is low weight, I assume, okay, this, this oracle that I had here really gave me LPN samples. So in this, okay, and we'd have probability epsilon square, I will accept. And in case this x is uniformly random, then in fact what you get in the first phase, the z's are independent of the secret S2 that I chose. And you can show that in this, in this, in this case the probability, so this because, okay, because I will accept if this has low weight and because the adversary has no clue about S2, and if this has sufficiently high rank, this, this thing here will be basically uniformly random, this thing here. So if the adversary chooses any z1, z2, it's very unlikely that this will end up in a low weight vector, so exponentially small probability. So anyway, um, there has been like tons of follow-up work on uh, protocols who try to make this protocol active secure and then other, pro uh, I guess, secure against many middle attacks and uh, other papers that break this again. So this is from this website. Okay, and those protocols are all HP, uh, about protocols that are a HP or like extensions. So I showed you HP plus, there was like HP sharp, HP plus plus and others. Okay, now I will show you a protocol which is completely different than it's, it's not the HP style protocol and it has two rounds and it works as follows. So we can have a verifier and a prover. They have a secret of length. Okay, so we have some parameters, uh, parameter K chosen such that the LPN problem with, of, with secrets of length k and some security uh, error noise tau is hard. Okay, I define L to be slightly more than two times k. Okay, and n is a statistical security parameter. The secret is of length to L and is shared between two. So what the verifier now does, so in the HP protocol he chooses a random, a random vector r to be taken as the inner product. Now he does something else. Now he chooses a vector v which has its length to, uh, to L and has weight that's exactly L wants. At a random V, and you are constrained on the, on the fact that it has weight L. Pro verifier sends this over to the prover. What does the prover do? He samples the error vector, uh, okay, uh, a random matrix. So uh, think of, uh, for the moment that this is just a random element, uh, uh, a random vector of length L. And he takes the inner product of this random R with SV. What is SV? SV is this, this if you have the secret S, and you delete all the elements where V is zero, that's what I call SV. So it's like basically this V defines like a subset of S. And you take the inner product of, of, of this, this, this random, random vector R with this subset of S and add the arrow E to it. Okay, and you do this actually N times in parallel basically. So you choose the R which is like N vectors of length L and you take the inner product with the, this subset N time and you add this arrow vector of like E random elements E noise, noise elements, each one biased towards one. You send this over to the verifier. What does the verifier do? He checks if this matrix R has actually full rank, which it will have almost certainly if it's chosen randomly. And then, yeah, it checks if the, what, what, what is the weight of, of this term here. So what should, of, so it, it takes the Z's and adds basically this term here, RT times SV to it. And if computed correctly, this should have weight roughly N times tau because if there's an elements, uh, this, this, this is should basically, so this should basically be the error vector, which should have roughly weight n times tau. So if, if it's significantly more than this, so tau prime is some, some constant which is bigger than tau and smaller than one half, if it's significantly better, uh, uh, if it's significantly larger than this, then I reject, otherwise I accept. And that's, just, that's the, the theorem, so if, uh, if the learning LPN problem with, security per, uh, of, with secrets of length k is hard, then actually the active security of this protocol is basically the same epsilon, okay, minus something exponentially small in, uh, in this statistical security parameter. So the constant here depends on, on basically on tau and on how much bigger than two this is. So this, but it's, okay. Uh, okay, I want to do a proof on this blackboard, but I think I'm running out of time anyway, so I think I skipped that. But the proof is really cute. It's a proof is, uh... Okay, so uh, let me conclude. So I showed you a new adaptive assumption, for, uh, which is like similar to the new adaptive assumption, which is equivalent to uh, the learning with errors problem. Uh, so as one application, I showed you like a new protocol, 
Oh, okay, I should maybe say a few things about this protocol. So why is this better than HP Plus? So for one thing, it has uh, one round less. So it's two round, which I think it's for the, for the goal of this protocol, which is like this high efficient, uh, highly efficient authentication protocol for RFID tags. I think this makes, makes a difference because actually it's probably even going to be four rounds if you use HP Plus because you have to, take, to tell to the, to, the, to the tag that you now want to start the interaction and he has to send you something, you send something, and so on. Okay, it's, it's rewindable for the verifier, that's HP Plus, it's also not, and it has a tight security reduction. So you see here is Epsilon, and what you got before with this rewind, so there's no rewinding going on in the proof. What you did before with the rewinding gave you Epsi, Epsilon squared. Okay, so I showed you this new protocol. We also have a, a very efficient Mac from uh, LPN, but it's not really a Mac, it's, it's a randomized Mac, and it only satisfies a weaker security uh, notion where you're not allowed to actually ask for verification queries for, for Macs, for messages that you have already received. So you cannot get a Mac and slightly change something and ask if it's still valid. So, but okay, uh, you can still authenticate communication with this in a, in a passive setting. Of course, yeah, the question is what else can we do from this adaptive assumption? So, thank you. Time for your questions. Can you put the assumption again? The, the, the definition of the assumption? Yeah. Okay. So the adversary has to. Um, so when does the adversary choose our nets? The 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 so S is like in the box. S the is box secret. Thing. Okay. So now it's a, it's you make a query. So the adversary makes the query. It chooses R, right? It chooses R. No, the box chooses no. R. Right. So so what what is the adaptive part? So who chooses? This, the adaptive part is the projections. This this matrices this X R okay. and X S. So you choose. You you look at this and say, I'd like to have like in the product in this subspace. You know, please project the the secret into this subspace and the random R that you will choose into this subspace too and compute the inner product there. They choose, and they choose as many pairs as you want. Yeah. And yeah. Just for each query, we require that uh, the, 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 the overlap of the, uh, this, this, this two projections uh, overlap in the n-dimensional subspace. Because otherwise, if they overlap in the one-dimensional subspace, then yeah, he could, for example, cancel out everything and just keep the first bit of S. So, so, so I'm uh, just wondering if there is a way to formulate this, this, this kind of an a one-way function that uh, you can ask for it, you know, the, the output of a function of the input uh, It's probabilistic, it. right? Yes. So even if you make the same query twice, you get different outputs. Okay. So, actually, are you allowed to make the same query? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, so what, aren't you going to get something, you know, very close to each other? I mean, no, it's, you know, it's like, uh, LW, LWE is, is always the same uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. So, R is in ZQ to the M, right? This is a syntactic question. Yes, I'm sorry. R is in ZQ to the M. R is big and then it's projected down to ZQ to the N, yeah. Now the real question. Uh, if P of R is R times XR, so you write multiply, right? Then the problem becomes it's equivalent to LWE. Right, so that, that's so. Uh, but it's adapt. It's adaptive, right? It's not that uh, uh, the point is in. A, of course, if you just multiply once and. Uh, so you you cannot take P of R in the product with P of S, right? So that is uh, X R times R transpose times X S times S. Okay. So if the thing. What one more? Wait, wait, this was here. Yes. Yes. Good. Um, oh. Yeah, the product. So, so that's going to be R transpose times XR times big XR matrix XR times big matrix X S times S. Yeah. Transpose, yeah. Uh, so so that, that's why the, the matrices kind of come in between the R and S, and that's what makes it kind of different from. Uh, yeah. You, think you cannot push it to the other side? Or? Yeah, I cannot, you cannot push it to the other side. That's, yeah, yeah. You see, that's, that's basically, yeah, yeah. You have basically R on the left, S on the right, and this thing in the middle if you want. So yes. yes. 
It's, it, it's a bit redundant here. I feel you probably could, uh, probably it's equivalent if you, kill, if, you, if you leave out one of these x, I'm not sure. Well, if you put the xr on the right, it's equivalent. And the xs both out on the right, it's equivalent. So it's probably not the simplest, it's probably not the simplest. It's only uh, I mean, it's probably not the shortest thing. Maybe you can, yeah, maybe you can compress this somehow into one matrix. Probably you can't. Because yeah, I just care about the product of this. Probably, I think, if the adversary just sends this, it's, it's, it's the same. But I think it's easier to think about this that we project R. Maybe it's not, but uh, I thought it's easier to think about it if project R and S that you take in the product. Instead of having a R on the left, S on the right, and then some, this, this thing here, some matrix in the middle. I don't exactly know what this means, so. I know it's the same as the other thing, but... Uh... And you right away get negligible soundness, right? Because in the original dual wise <coughs> to the sequential implication, so that's and Shinka to show, your thing already has negligible soundness to begin with, right? Uh, because, you know, the point is... It's big matrices, right? You, you right away do parallel. Right? But I have to do right away parallel, and the reason is the following. You see, oh, this is the protocol. The reason is the following. Um, so cats and chin, like the HP plus protocol, you have like this basic round, which is like a gap between soundness and completeness here, and then you repeat in parallel. If, now assume I would do just the basic round, you just choose this one R here, and then you repeat this in parallel. Yeah. That's not secure. No. Because I need, you know, this is like, so the, because you have this additional constraint that the, if, if you repeat it n times, you would have to put the additional constraint that the R's chosen by, by the prover, uh, <laughs> He can't, he can't choose, you know, he can't be malicious and he can't choose like a diagonal matrix or something. It doesn't, I'm not, I cannot force him to choose randomly, but I need that the rank is big enough. So basically, he has to. You can do something slightly different. You can, uh, what you can do is you can, you can actually skip this check and uh, make the secret n bits longer, or you don't even need that, uh, n bits longer and, and put the identity matrix in front here. So then you kind of enforce that you always have rank n, and, but basically the first n, n elements. Uh, you can pre-compute them, they're always gonna, it's not gonna be less efficient because it's always gonna be the same vector that you basically add. And another thing is, here the prover has to check that this V really has weight L. And you can also get the, so this is, might not be, if, if you want to do it in RFID, this might not be very efficient, but you can get around this and add some, have an add other secret V prime that you always add to it. And the proof gets a bit more complicated and it's not gonna be, the weight of the X or is not gonna be exactly L, but it still goes. Fixing attack uh, thing is so protecting against bit fixing attacks is kind of trivial, right? I mean, uh, so if I, if I fix a whole bunch of bits of R, uh, coefficients of R, then that's a, that's like leaving these coefficients of S out. Yeah, but again, you can do it adaptively. I can do a query. I can. Yeah, yeah. I can I can fix some bits here, and then I get the sample in the next in the next. Invocation, I fix other bits of R and I get the sample. And no. this, so it's really the, the, really thing, the, the, the real thing here is that makes it, I think, a bit surprising that this is equivalent to the adaptivity. If you just would have, you know, if the adversary chooses these matrices once and that's, then we use it all, all that that's would not be, not be used, and I wouldn't see how it would be useful also. It's the adaptivity that makes it, uh, makes it useful. Question? Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Our, uh, our next speaker is uh, Yevgeny Dodes from NYU talking about uh, talking about um, cryptography against continuous memory attacks. Thanks, good tech. Uh, I'll put up my slides. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, leakage resilient cryptography. Um, and just kind of a quick motivation is probably unnecessary here, but I'll just run through it. Anyway, so traditionally in cryptography, we assume a very nice kind of abstraction that secret keys are perfectly secure. So for example, when you use public key cryptography, public key, the adversary only sees public key, but there is some kind of wall, so the secret key is really in the safe, and there is a very well-defined interface between uh, the way, you know, what kind of usages of the secret keys the attacker can see. Maybe he can see exactly signatures, or maybe some ciphertext, but, you know, he can see precisely things that the protocol wants the attacker to see in some well-defined adversarial model. And of course, in practice, uh, ironically, I'm, you know, I'm not putting uh, references, but there are a million of references that wouldn't have fit on the slide. Uh, in reality, most the cryptography is actually broken, not because somebody breaks RSA or factoring, 
but because of some security things. That's why security gets much more like federal funding and so on. Uh, not because it's like scientifically deeper, but because you know that's unfortunately what happens in practice. Uh, you know, you get all kinds of like side channel attacks. You know, there is this cold boot attack which received a lot of attention from Princeton. And of course, there are all kinds of hackers and so on. So what those guys do? Typically, the secret key sits uh, maybe on some server or on some smart card or something like that. And then one way or another, the attacker gets all kinds of sneaky, geeky machines like thermometers and uh, electromagnetic things or so whatever. Some things that, you know, when you design crypto system, we don't really think of as some weird stuff uh, which is really outside the model. And usually one way or another, through this weird stuff, which is completely outside our idealized model, the attacker gets partial and, you know, unfortunately, in some cases, even complete information about the secret key. So until recently, even though kind of, you know, there are a lot of, you know, almost anything in cryptography, you can kind of, you know, relate it to leakage. But until recently, essentially, the usual response of cryptographers is, Look, what can we do? I mean, I don't know about thermometers or, you know, electromagnetic waves. I'm not going to write papers with, like, thermometers and, uh, you know, the model or something like that. So uh, it's not really our program. Look, we have a clean model. You guys who have uh, electrical engineers or uh, programmers or security guys or firewall experts or uh, guys, uh, you know, uh, security guards downstairs, you, you really have to do a better job to make sure that our keys are not stolen. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, you know, and of course those guys says, oh, look, it's inevitable, something gets stolen. So anyway, so probably what you guys prove is anyway relevant. So there is this uh, blame game. Uh, but recently, uh, I guess there has been this dedicated effort from a cryptographic community to develop this leakage resilient cryptography and to say, look, let's try to help. Of course, we're not going to get to the low level uh, details how exactly uh, you're going to, uh, you know, get information about the secret key, even though we'll try to be as general as we can. Uh, but let's let let's add this uh, highly adversarially specified leakage to the idealized adversarial attack model, and I'll talk about it in the next few slides. There are many options how to do it. And then what we want to do, after we add this well-defined kind of leakage oracle, but still adversarially chosen leakage oracle um, to our model, we want to design primitives which are pu um, probably secure even if the adversary sees some leakage of the secret key. And hopefully this will allow us to bridge the gap between theory and practice. And you know, this is an active young field. Uh, it remains to be seen how far it can bridge the gap, but it's kind of a very highly promising direction and I'm excited about it. So how do we model leakage? Well, the start is easy. Abstractly as theoreticians, let's start with the theory. We will just give the attacker um, what we call a leakage oracle, so there is this uh, owl or whatever it is that will know the secret key and the attacker can specify some function f without loss of generality to a bit because maybe you can call the oracle multiple times and you'll just get one bit of secret, you know, the function of the secret key. And of course you can say, okay, great, I mean, give me first bit of the secret key, give me second bit of the secret key. I mean, you're not going to prove any security. So naturally, we somehow need to restrict the leakage such that the attacker doesn't get secret key in full. And, you know, uh, one of the stupid comments I got in a grant application when I wrote something like that, people, you know, somebody says, oh, it's like a theoretician, how can you do it? What does attacker get something in full? Uh, well, that's kind of a stupid comment, but uh, still let me, uh, yeah, I mean, look, unfortunately, we cannot do magic, we cannot do everything. So if somehow you really don't protect your secret keys, that, you know, the attacker is powerf powerful enough to get it in full, uh, there is nothing maybe you can do. But at least if it's reasonable and some of the attacks actually don't get the key in full because maybe they don't get full access, they just measure some temperature or something like that, it would be very nice to kind of say something probably secure about that. So uh, what it means, it justifies that if you want to actually put cryptography and provable security here, we have to uh, put some restrictions on the kind of access. And actually there are two kinds of dimensions of restrictions that we can put. So one, I'll talk about it on the next slides, but roughly the first dimension is um, to bound the number of queries during various stages of the attacks. So kind of you learn maybe one bit, so you don't learn like too much. And also maybe uh, the second kind of orthogonal direction is maybe restrict the type of leakage function. Maybe you can you know, compute only like low complexity functions or some noisy functions or something. I'll give you some examples in a second. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of abstractly what we are going to do. So let me talk a little bit more about this leakage model and from the purposes of this talk, I want to make the following distinction. The first distinction is the last two bullets of the slides. I'm going to distinction, uh, to make a distinction between restricted attacks versus memory. So kind of green is better than red uh, throughout the slides. Um, 
So restricted, I'm not putting references, I'll put references uh, at the end if I have time. Uh, but people kind of consider, well, maybe that are considered physical bits, like, uh, well, in Christoph's case, it was tem more, more like tempering, but, uh, you know, there was work on like physical bits, maybe it's some kind of low complexity circuit, something, for example, in complexity called AC0 circuits, so you cannot compute even parity or something like that. Uh, a very popular axiom, uh, or variance of this axiom, is this only computation leaks information. So, for example, if you don't touch part of the secret key, you cannot leak on that secret key. Um, um, and, you know, variance of this axiom, like independent leakage and so on, and, and so on. So this is also very, very interesting type, type of work. Uh, well, the problem is, of course, it's not, you know, fully general. And the second problem kind of really forces you to be, to still do proofs with respect to, you know, somewhat particular kinds of things. You need to know how the secret key is stored in memory and so on. And, of course, there is uh, this memory, what I call memory leakage, where, you know, I will say, look, any efficient function f is legal. I'm not going to place any restrictions. Uh, so definitely, if I can protect here, I'm in great shape. Um, and of course, the second very big distinction, which is, you know, recently started to be kind of more pronounced, but, um, you know, it, it definitely is a very important distinction. So informally, I will call it one-time versus continual leakage. So one-time, it doesn't mean that you can call the oracle only one time, but essentially it just means that there is an a priori upper bound on how many times you call um, the oracle throughout the lifetime of the system. So overall, there is some leakage, we call it leakage parameter capital L, and you can call the oracle at most like capital L times, and usually let's say capital L is less than the length of the secret or something like that. Uh, right, so this is uh, what I call one-time schemes, and continuous leakage schemes, um, so let's change our model. I don't, it's unrealistic still, maybe if my scheme is used for a while, you know, eventually the attacker will get more information on the secret key, so this model is kind of interesting. It's, uh, it's very, you know, at least to some beautiful theory, uh, but still this model might not be applicable. There are some relaxations of this model, something called boundary retrieval model and so on, but still this assumption in the long run is going to be problematic. Uh, so the second line, it relaxes the model a little bit to achieve stronger security. You can say, you know what, we are going to periodically refresh the secret key. So, you know, initially, let's say I will draw it kind of in different colors. So initially I had this red secret key. Then somehow after a while, I think, well, you know, maybe too much of the secret key is kind of leaked. Maybe it's safe, I should refresh my secret key. So now it becomes kind of green. Maybe I refresh it again, it becomes yellow, and so on. So then in between the refreshes, you still will necessarily bound the number of leakage queries, so the amount of information that attacker can get about the secret key. But you can say, look, if I refresh frequently enough, and I'll talk more about refreshing in a second, this is hopefully realistic, but overall, the overall leakage of the system is not leaked. So this is really what practitioners, if you talk to Adi Shamir or other people uh, also in practice, uh, uh, you know, I talk to various people, this is really, this is a model where, you know, I contributed a lot of, uh, you know, works, but uh, it's a nice theoretical model, but in practice, I mean, it's useful for this model, but really this is a model that, you know, practitioners want because this is what realistic side channel attacks uh, do. Okay, so kind of to summarize, we have these two largely orthogonal, there is some intersection, but largely orthogonal dimensions, you know, one time versus continuous, restricted versus memory attacks. And very roughly, there was, there was a lot of work, especially recently, starting from 09 or 10, you can see a lot of references here to these years, and I, I cannot like really cover all this work. Uh, but there has been a lot of very, very interesting, beautiful work um, on all kinds of things. Uh, but unfortunately, so far, um, you know, uh, this corner uh, was pretty much untouched. I mean, I will talk about what was known, but not much. AK? AK, oh, as authenticated key agreement. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, you know, authenticated if you or something like that, yeah. So, uh, so essentially, really, if I, want, if I don't want to worry about learning computation leaks information, something completely unrestricted leakage, but I want to have continuous things, so the secret key kind of updates, nothing was known so far, and this is what they tried to achieve in this work. So can we achieve the best of both worlds? And throughout this talk, that's what I'm going to call CLR. It doesn't mean Corman, Lizards, and Revest. It means, uh, uh, you know, continuous leakage resilience. So this is a model um, that, you know, we're going to try to get the first scheme in this model, okay? So um, I'll, just to recap our model of continuous leakage resilience, uh, I mean, I kind of said it, but let's be precise because it was all these random references and so on. Um, the secret key will be updated it will be updated only using local randomness, so I don't want like any external servers or like time periods or something like that. Just I myself on my computer, 
you know, ideally, hopefully, using good randomness, will uh, locally refresh my secret key. Other users, they do not need to know that updates exist. They do not need to know how frequent they are. I don't need to do updates periodically. It's completely up to me. If I think I'm more compromised, I will update more frequently. If I think, you know, I've been sitting at home and didn't do much, I will not update. It's completely up to me. In particular, the public key doesn't change, right? Because other people don't know, so definitely I cannot change public key. So for other people, they don't know. It's totally my own local maintenance procedure to periodically refresh my secret key. And no time periods, no, no synchronized clocks, nothing like that. OK, so clean model like that. Uh, number, as I said, number of leakage queries will be bounded by this parameter L, which will be less than the secret key um, in between the updates, but there is no bound over the lifetime of the system. And Update is not, there's no leakage during update. I'll talk about it. Okay. So, I mean, everything, I you know, work very hard, everything, I think, I will be very surprised if there is a question which is not answered on the slide, but still okay. feel free to answer questions, uh, to ask questions. So, uh, there will be no restrictions on the time of leakage, so this will be a memory attack. So, and intuitive way we will get our security is that adversary, you know, when he breaks in now, he cannot predict my future randomness. Um, so for example, you cannot do this, you know, future, this kind of pretty unrealistic attack that you will kind of break key and compute what would my key be like 20 years from now, or whatever like, and then for every new kind of break in, compute the next bit of my secret key 20 years from now. So very important question to, for, as uh, Tom asked, uh, do we allow leakage during key updates? In practice, it's extremely important that we allow leakage during key update, but in our schemes, uh, our final scheme uh, will have it. I'll talk about it, but in the basic model, we'll already have our hands full with a model where we will not allow any leakage during key updates. As you'll see, it's still highly non-trivial because it's completely local. There is no external server um, and so on. And the key still have to remain functional. I cannot just wipe out my secret key because, you know, it has to correspond to a public key. It has to remain functional. So it's not a trivial thing. But for now, let's assume that the updates are leak-free. And I will show you a completely general theorem which will kind of allow us to generically go from this model to the model where we allow some leakage during key updates. But for now, this is a great question. And of course, another thing, we definitely don't want our schemes uh, to have efficiency which kind of degrades even logarithmically with the number of updates. Yeah. Fresh, you erase the past secret key. That's actually a good one. Yes, so I do assume erasures, yeah. <laughs> so I assume. Well, I mean, even if I have, a, yeah, I mean, formally perfect erasures, but you can kind of put imperfect, imperfectness of erasures into this leakage shell. You can say, look, I assume every time I erase, maybe like seven bits of my secret key is not leaked, so this can be kind of formally modeled that, you know, I decrease that by, by seven and the attacker also learns. So you, you can do so, but yeah, I, I assume, uh, you know, perfect uh, erasure. So I the question, this is actually very important. So I tried to be as precise as I could about the model, but it's very important that we get it good. Um, so, uh, so the was maybe other works, but the most uh, kind of central work is most relevant to our problem. So nothing was known. Is the first observation we had encrypted two years ago, where we kind of designed these one-time schemes, uh, you know, in the mem against memory attacks, and we noticed that it's very trivial to have a variant of CLR signatures where the updates require external master key, which never leaks. So this master key is only used it's like I put it on some you know, external CD or something like that. And I don't need it to run regular operations like regular signatures and so on. But when I do updates, maybe I go offline or something like that, and I just refresh my secret key. And it's actually not completely trivial transformation, but, uh, but it's uh, pre pretty simple. It's just a pretty simple way to take a regular signature scheme and a one-time secure signature scheme, you know, one-time leakage resilient signature scheme, and compose them together. I'll let you think about it, but it's pretty simple. Uh, so, and then there is a very nice paper that I'll mention a little bit at the end of, uh, by Vinod and others also in the upcoming Fox. Uh, but the initial kind of results that we knew before we started our work, they kind of had a, you know, I would say semi-heuristic indication that maybe actually this remarkable primitive of continuous leakage resilience is possible. So they give a construction of CLR signatures uh, based on a pretty strong non-standard assumption uh, which, for technical reasons, they kind of you know, use the hash function inside this assumption, but uh, uh, even if the hash function is modeled as a random oracle, you, for technical reasons, cannot prove security, but you can make a highly non-standard assumption about PCPs and so on that uh, will kind of uh, show that some extremely inefficient CLR signatures might exist. So it kind of gives us some hope, but it's definitely inefficient. 
Uh, so it's kind of, you know, was a big question, you know, can you actually really do something useful? So our results, uh, so we build CLR schemes under standard assumptions. Well, the assumption is uh, called K-linear assumption, which is by now a standard assumption by linear group. So we, we will use, uh, you know, a little bit of pairing separation. Uh, but as I said, uh, well, I'll mention it on the next bullets. Uh, so in the best uh, schemes, we can leak up to one half of the secret key in between our updates. All the schemes are really practical efficient. They are, well, they use pairings. But essentially, any scheme, you know, take a scheme which uses pairing, so scheme will be essentially as efficient as that scheme, maybe like 20% slow or something like that. Uh, but it's really, it's not like some theoretical thing. It's a concrete, very, very efficient schemes, okay? Uh, uh, and which are additionally continuous leakage resilient. And even though these applications are kind of the main applications, the way we derive this application, we build this primitive, which is the most basic cryptographic primitive, which is useful by, by itself, maybe not that interesting which is one-way relation, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And once we build one-way relation, we will uh, plug in previous machinery, which is, you know, non-trivial machinery, but we will plug in machinery, previous machinery, and kind of argue that it works with our stuff, and we get this more advanced application, which is interesting stuff, but I, you know, I really want to tell you as a novelty, so I will really concentrate largely on this continuous leakage resilient one-way relation for much of the talk. So let me tell you the definition. It's kind of, you can guess it, but let me be explicit so that we're on the same page. So uh, is, uh, uh, one way relation in general is, you know, there is a key generation procedure that outputs a secret key and a public key, okay? And, you know, there is a verification procedure, some relation R, which kind of checks if the secret key really will open the public key. And, you know, under normal circumstances, it should open, so that's great. But the attacker, who doesn't know, who only gets the public key, it's very hard, as computationally hard, to find any secret key which will satisfy the relation. Right, it's kind of a generalization of one-wayness, but instead of one-way functions, we talk about relations, general relations as opposed to functions. All right, so this is a standard notion of security. So what we will want, we will want to have a CLR relations, so we will also want to have a new procedure which didn't exist before, which is this re-randomization procedure, which uses only local randomness, which allows us to re-randomize a secret key, right? And, uh, and the correctness should be the new key, the green key should still verify, so, you know, we want to do it, you know. And we can do it as many times as we want, you know, the efficiency shouldn't degrade, kind of. And all those green, red, blue, whatever other colors, all the keys should be good. So this is just kind of correctness, the new kind of correctness requirements. Good. So what about security? The security is exactly what you would expect. So the attacker starts with maybe the red key. He can ask up to L queries about the red guy. You know, what's the second bit? What is like the third bit of SHA-2 of the secret key? What's like fast Fourier transform, like, you know, 17th bit of something like that? You know, collect this information, get this part of the secret key. Now the key for now is securely refreshed, but as I said, we'll add randomness, you know, leakage during randomness later, but for now it's perfectly securely refreshed. It becomes green. The attacker again asks question. It gets uh, this, you know, green guy. Then the key is refreshed to yellow. It gets, you know, parts of the yellow guy. And for arbitrary no polynomial number of periods, he gets this information. So the total leakage could be unbounded, right? It's just bounded in between the periods, right? And now the attacker does some magic thing. He tries to combine the keys, you know, you know to form a meaningful key, and he shouldn't be able to succeed. Okay, so this is a notion of continuous leakage resilient one relation. Hopefully, very natural notion. So we're trying to kind of, you know, abstract really the novelty. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. So uh, very briefly, kind of informally, what's the difficulty in constructing one-way relations? And, well, aside from the fact that they ha it hasn't been done. Um, so in reduction, if you think about it, you know, you need to know many secret keys in full. Because intuitively, how else would you simulate leakage if you don't know the secret key in full and you should be able to, to, you know, answer arbitrary function. You kind of need to know many valid secret keys, right? Uh, nevertheless, when the attacker forges, when the attacker kind of forges a secret key for the relation, you need to solve some hard problem, right? So intuitively, what you want to hope, you hope that some who's a forgery is of a different type than the kind of keys that you know, right? But the attacker gets unbounded now amount of information in total. So intuitively, I mean, how do you ensure that through this overall unbounded number of information, the attacker doesn't learn the kind of type of the keys that you know. Yeah. Signature exactly. In some sense, it's, it's similar to the signature paradox, except here in some sense it's, you know, well, I would argue it's even harder, 
uh, because you know there is this leakage queries. But yeah, it's kind of for the signature. You need to be able to forge signatures of messages, and yet from a new you know message, uh, you can do stuff. But you know there you can do more stuff. You can change public keys in the reduction. So here, kind of the in some sense, the public key has to stay the same. But it's very similar indeed. We'll manage to overcome this difficulty. I'm just kind of pointing out, you know, the difficulty, and at least in particular, non you know previous techniques kind of would fail precisely, let's say, previous technique for one-time leakage you know, wouldn't extend precisely for this difficulty. Right, so this is kind of the deep, but you know, we'll solve it. And hopefully I'll try to uh, you know, tell you how we'll solve it in a general way before go getting into specific assumptions. This is the outline. First, I will uh, tell you a general strategy, which in some sense will be the heart of kind of how to go from continuous leakage to one-time leakage to a more complicated problem of one-time leakage that was previously known how to solve, but still would be one-time leakage. Then we'll show how to uh, relatively specialized but still general constructions that if we have special encryption and non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, we would be able to uh, you know, solve this one-time leakage problem. And finally, I will show you an efficient instantiation of these components based on this assumption. Due to not general leakage, just bit, uh, uh, yeah. does it become easier? Yeah, the bit leakage is kind of, definitely with secure update is trivial. You can use AUNTs generically. For any primitive, you can use something called all-nothing transform. You store something big, and, uh, uh, and then you know that if the attacker learns few bits, the real secret is kind of secure. So the, yeah, for bits, bit leakage is, yeah. And refresh is like from fresh, recompute the secret and encode it again. It's trivial, at least without leakage. Of randomness, so, yeah. yeah. During so during the refresh, I'll show some do, do, uh, general theorem, but uh, uh, I'm pretty sure in five minutes we'll come up with a scheme like that. Okay. You know, so in two so minutes, yeah. It's, it's trivial, yeah. With, uh, general, general functions, yeah. That's really the difficulty, yeah. Okay. I mean, not just bits as opposed to, you know, you know anything else, yeah. Completely general functions, yeah. So, uh, all right, so let's start with this. So I'm going to give you, so this is a strategy. So this is a little bit, uh, I think the definition is very natural, but essentially I'm going to tell you if I can define a special kind of one-way relation, which has some special properties, it will automatically be continuous leakage secure. Okay, so what is the kind of relation? So imagine this is a space of all possible secret keys, and there will be, and you know, we can always, given a relation, have this blue set of valid secret keys. Those are secret keys that just verify. This is a set of valid secret keys. Technically, any of the secret key is verified. But somehow, secretly, there will be two, this set will be partitioned into good keys, green keys, and bad keys, red keys, right? So we'll have to design some schemes that it's kind of, the secret key is kind of secretly partitioned into two sets. And um, in, during key generation, not only do we sample public key and secret key, but we can sample three keys which are only used in proofs of security, but they're not used kind of in the scheme. But we can kind of sample three keys. We can sample a sample, SAM G key, which intuitively allows to sample a random good key. We can sample some B, which is kind of some key which intuitively allows to sample a random bad key. And we can also sample a trapdoor so that we can actually, which actually can tell them apart. So that, you know, just which essentially defines what is good and what is bad, right? So what are the white keys in the picture of that? Oh, this, this is invalid. So this is just a space zero, one to the, you know, if the secret key is 1,000, this is, this is just, all possible keys, this is the keys that don't verify. I mean, they will disappear very shortly. <laughs> it's just, just saying this is a global set of the domain of keys, yeah, secret keys. Good. So, uh, right, so the, uh, decay is a key which just allows me to actually to test. Given a valid secret key, it will tell me, is it, is it green? It's just to formally, what, it, what, it, what does green and red mean, actually? I mean, decay is a formal way to define what green and red actually means. Good. And also, of course, and we need the syntactic property which will allow us to randomize. We still need, this is already exists in CLR, we need to be able to randomize actually green keys. So given a green key using local randomness, I, can, I should be intuitively able to sample a completely fresh green key. So intuitively this uh, procedure event, which is exactly the procedure which we'll use, uh, actually if it happens to get a key which is good, it's not going to sample, maybe it's actually going to sample essentially a random uh, good key. So that's the kind of restriction, uh, you know, that we will put on our re procedure. Okay, okay. So is it clear? So this is a kind of this is a kind of I'll tell you security properties in a second, but this is a kind of syntactic properties that I want for now. Yep. Any questions? The distinction between should hold. Oh, I, no, no security properties yet. I'll put them on the next slide. Okay. So there is no security. This is just syntax for now. Okay. Now security. 
So uh, I want like two complementary properties, hardness of good keys and hardness of bad keys. The uh, hardness of good keys says that even if I give you essentially a way to, you can sample yourself arbitrary many red keys. If you want, I give you the sampling key for red keys. It's computationally hard to get a green key. So given, not just even, it's not like I just give you a red key. I even give you, you can sample as many as you want red keys. You cannot get a green key. And the other way around. Right? So these keys are kind of, from one, it's hard to get to that. So they're kind of, in some sense, very difficult. Okay? I mean, very different from each other. And the new property, which is in some sense, all properties are important in the proof, as you will see, but this is really the key property that will allow us to push stuff forward. We call it leakage indistinguishability property. And leakage indistinguishability property says that, you know, the adversary get public and he can sample both good and best keys. He can do, you know, whatever he wants. Behind my back, I sample, it's essentially it will say that red keys look like, are indistinguishable from green keys. I will pick at random one of the keys, okay? And I don't give you it in full, but you can get up to L bits of leakage about the key that I picked behind my back. So you can learn a lot of information, but not all of the information. And then you output an arbitrary key as a key, SK star, and you win if SK star is in the same category as the key behind my back. So essentially you're trying to guess which key I picked behind my back, but you don't see it completely, you do, you see this. Well, of course, just kind of to make sure that you follow, What's the problem if you see it completely? I claim this property is impossible to satisfy. You just copy the key, right? And so just, you know, just to make sure why it's not trivial. Yeah, of course. So there is, uh, right, so this is, uh, but with leakage, leakage indistinguishability will kind of say, but it, it really doesn't say, it doesn't say that it's hard like to copy my key. It really says you cannot correlate because you can sample arbitrarily your own keys. You really cannot kind of, uh, you know, correlate intuitively, it says that you cannot correlate the category of your key, the ones that you come up. Because notice, you cannot even test yourself if your key is green and red. You know, red, but you, um, you know, you cannot correlate it with a hidden key. Yeah, we were thinking about leakage non-malleability. It's just non-malleability, you know, it focuses on one aspect, but we really wanted to emphasize, because it's both indistinguishability and non-malleability, so uh, in some sense. Yeah, it, it has aspects of both. We, we felt like indistinguishability is a more important thing to stress, at least for, for the intuition, but yeah. Yeah. You, can, you need another distinguishability property from the previous slide, right? No. Oh yeah, this is, uh, it will be statistical, but yeah. This is, I view it a correctness property, but yeah, sure. I view it more as a correctness property. Yeah, on the previous slide that if you just randomize the secret key, you get a fresh key. But yeah, you, you, you can view it as security property, but I view it as a correctness property. I mean, there is no attacker, it's just... Good. All right. So now I claim, so we call it leakage indistinguishable randomizable relation, uh, short Long Island Railroad, uh, LIR. And the important thing, is, look, this is a really weird primitive. You say, what? I mean, you have this beautiful continuous leakage resilient one-way relation. You know, natural definition, exactly what you want. Now you give me the three new trapdoors and so on. The important thing is that this weird new property is a one-time property. And I claim, and as we will see, as I'll show you next slide, Anything which is like this weird one, satisfies this weird time, one time property, I can do a hybrid argument to get a reusable property. Okay? So let's see the proof. It's actually very simple intuitively. It, it is really simple. So let's start with the real experiment for continuous leakage resilience. So the attacker sees, you know, only good keys. We randomize. Essentially, we start with a green key. And, you know, we keep randomizing it. It always is inside the green stuff. And you get leakage on these things and so on. And then eventually you come up with a forgery. Okay? So I claim that your forgery must be a good key. Why? Because look, if you only see green keys and then you output a red key, you broke hardness of red keys, right? From only green keys, you, can come, you came up with a red key. That should be hard, right? So the forgery should be red. This is our first property. Now I'm kind of going to play this hybrid game with the adversary. One by one, I'm just going to switch, you know, a key from green to red. Just one by one, I'm going to make these hybrid games where I just switch one key from good to bad. And I'll see if the attacker notices. And I claim, but leakage indistinguishability, the forgery, every time I do one, one switch like that, the forgery should still remain good. So it's kind of unlikely that, you know, I switch one key from red, uh, from green to red, and previously the attacker forged a green key, and now suddenly the attacker forges a red key. He said, look, assume he does it, that contradicts leakage indistinguishability because the only difference between these two wells is that one key, essentially I picked one key behind my back, you got L bits of leakage about the key, 
And suddenly you manage to output a key in a different category. Kind of you correlated with the categories that I had. Essentially, you initially it was green, and now I changed it to red, you started to get red. So this is exactly leakage indistinguishability. And of course, you can say, oh, wait a second, how do you get these other keys? Remember, leakage indistinguishability holds even if you have your own sampling keys. So those, those keys and these keys you can sample yourself. Right? So this is intuitively. So leakage indistinguishability will allow you to do this hybrid argument. And finally, all the keys are red, but the forgery still is, remains green. But that will contradict the hardness of good keys. Because now, in these hybrid experiments, all the leakage is from the red keys, but you still forge a green key, and that's a contradiction, because green keys are hard to get from red keys. All right, so this is, uh, any questions about this? All right, so anyway, so this is maybe abstract, I'm sorry, it's, you know, it's a, but you know, it really took us a while to abstract these properties, it maybe looks trivial <laughs> at the end, but it really simplified us to kind of present our construction this way. So now the construction based on PK in Isaac, um, so this is uh, the outline of the construction. So we're going to use some magical, two magical encryption schemes and, you know, non-interactive, so, and I apologize, hopefully you'll get at least, if you get even that part up, up to now, it's fine. Uh, I think the construction is natural, but you know, unfortunately it is, you know, slow and technical. Um, but it's intuitive. So anyway, I have two public encryption schemes, you know, and a special non-interactive zero-knowledge proof. And here is the syntax of my LIR. So my public key will be, you know, common reference string for the NISICs. It will be two public keys and a ciphertext. Essentially, my public key is encryption of a random message. So ignore those other public keys. A public key is encryption of a random message, okay? The syntax of the secret key will contain another ciphertext and a proof. And intuitively, valid secret keys will say C2 encrypts the same message. So C1 and C2 encrypt the same message. But maybe they don't really encrypt it, but the proof verifies. So valid secret keys means that P really proves that C1 and C2 are encryptions of the same message. Okay, so public key is encryption one of the message, and intuitively a secret key should be encryption two of this message and a proof that this is a good encryption. So a good secret key will actually mean that they really encrypt the same message. So if you actually decrypt, you get, it's not just the proof verifies because maybe it's a fake proof, maybe somebody forged the proof, but it really means that they decrypt the same to the same message, okay? And I claim you can sample very easily from this thing with a trapdoor which is M and R. So if I give you the message and the randomness used to encrypt this thing, you know the message, you just encrypt the message under the second key yourself, you have the witness, R is the witness, so you generate the proof yourself honestly, so you can easily sample fresh secret keys, right? Using this trapdoor, you can sample fresh secret keys, right? So this is good keys. And what are bad keys? Intuitively, bad keys are the keys which don't encrypt the same message, but for which the proof verifies. And those are very easy to sample. You like encrypt garbage. And if you have a, what is called simulation trapdoor for NISIC, for those of you who know, simulation trapdoor allows you to prove arbitrary kind of, you know, valid proofs for arbitrary junk. Uh, so intuitively, it will allow you to, be, to, 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 to give proofs of false statements, okay? So this is the syntax of the construction. We are far from done, but this is the syntax of the construction, okay? So and distinguishing, how do you distinguish them? Well, if I give you two secret keys, you can distinguish. You just decrypt and check if the messages are the same, all right? So anyway, this is the syntax. Okay, good. Uh, now we just need to briefly argue these properties. And it turns out some of them will be actually not that complicated. So let's start with a simple property, almost a trivial property, which is a hardness properties, right? So this is a scheme, I'm sorry, just trust me, it's the same scheme. You know, encryption of a random message, encryption of a random message is a proof. So I claim that if E1 is just semantically secure, even one way secure, and pi is a sound proof, you cannot prove false statements, the scheme has this hardness. Look, I assume I'm giving you a trapdoor to generate good, good keys. So you have the message and the randomness. Right? And you need to produce a bad key. What is a bad key? It means that you need to encrypt a different message and fake a proof. Well, but that means you fake a proof. You, you produce a proof of a false statement. That should be hard. Right? So given you know, a message and randomness, it should be very hard for you to fake the proof. Soundness of the NISB. Now, if I give you a way to generate fake proofs of arbitrary statement, it doesn't really matter. Uh, how can you produce a good proof? Well, a good proof, it means that I encrypted a random message. I give you encryption of a random message. Now, what you need to do, you need to produce a different encryption of the same message. Well, but if you produce a different encryption of the same message, it means that you inverted the, you know, the encryption. Because I can just decrypt it and, yeah. Getting something 
Why, if the adversary has M and R and the public key has the encryption key, why can't he just encrypt the same? The adversary will not see it. Remember, these keys, I'm sorry, these keys are just mental experiments. So I just need to tell you how to do a key generation so that I simultaneously also generate this a way to, simul to sample a random good key, a way to sample a random bad key. And this, so the adversary, I mean, in some of the properties, the adversary will get this key. Sorry, okay. So it depends on which property. So in the property of hardness of good keys, of hardness of bad keys, he will get MNR. So he will get MNR, but his job is to forge a bad key. What does it mean to forge a get key? It means that he has to produce encryption of a different message M and a proof that verifies. He has MNR and he has a public key, sure. But he has to encrypt, it has to be a bad key. Of course he can encrypt a good, you know, an M again and produce a good proof. But then... Yeah, because yeah, he doesn't know the trapdoor to the CRS. So this is, he only gets a sample, a good sampling key, he cannot produce a bad thing. Okay. So he, on the other hand, he will actually get the trapdoor so that he can fake proofs, but his job is to produce a good key. And that intuitively means that he has to encrypt, decrypt E1. He has to break encryption of E1. Right? So these two properties, yeah. Hey, why cannot he just like bring encrypt? Uh, so what ring so intuitively well because uh, if he re-encrypts it means that he decrypted the first encryption because I give you encryption of a random message I don't tell you you produce a different encryption of the same message right uh, I don't care that you know the trap on some proof but it has to be of the same message under a different public key so it means that look you could have in the first re in the reduction to the security of e1 I can just choose a public secret key for the second encryption scheme. You produce an encryption of the thing, I decrypt it, and I break the first encryption scheme. Right? So these are like really simple properties. And so um, now, uh, you know, I'm going to do re-randomization. So this is something where we start to need to make serious assumptions. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. If you go back to the, uh, to the hardness of the back keys, Oh, say the public key encryption scheme happens to be homomorphic, then, sure. then so the key creates a ciphertext, which is a new ciphertext, but it's an encryption of the same message, and he has a trap door. But it's a different public key. So E1 and E2 have completely independent public keys. So this is not, it's not like I'm using the same E1 and, e, you know, it's not like I'm, I, I use two completely independent encryption schemes. So what I'm saying is if you can do it, it doesn't matter if it's homomorphic or not. In fact, our schemes will have to be homomorphic. I just break encryption. So I get a challenge, encryption of a random message. I pick public key secret key or for the second scheme myself. I give you that as a public key. You produce a second encryption of the same message. I decrypt it and say, oh, great. I, break, I broke my first thing. Good. So um, re-randomization. So now I will need to assume some special properties. And if you think about it, what is our secret key? It's a weird secret key. Our secret key is a ciphertext and a proof. So I need to re-randomize the ciphertext and the proof. So randomizing ciphertext, as you said, many encryptions will do it. In fact, if encryption is what is called homomorphic, it's very easy to randomize the ciphertext for many standard encryption schemes. Proof is a little bit weird because after we randomize C2, the statement for the proof changes. The first pub is in ciphertext remains in the public key, but the second I just refreshed. So I need to kind of make sure that I need to update a NISIC proof, NISIC for some old statement, to a NISIC for a fresh NISIC for a new statement. So that will be kind of non-trivial. Um, so here's what we are going to assume. We are going to assume that E1, E2, and pi are homomorphic of appropriate groups. So for encryption, homomorphic is essentially natural. These three pluses are different, you know. They don't have to be the same. But intuitively, it just means that if you just add two encryptions up, it's like encryption of some of the messages, some of the uh, randomness. And essentially, any encryption you study in the first course, like Galvoser, Mikali, El Gamal, for appropriate meanings of plus will have this property. So this is, yeah. What does this update, updating NISIC use? Obviously, if you have a witness for the new statement, you're done. So, so this is the next two bullets. So let me, let me discuss it, but a great question. Yeah, this is like the new, the novel stuff, right? I mean, it's like how do you, you know, you have a NISIC for one statement, now you refresh the statement yourself and you need to update the proof. So this is tricky how you can do it. So it turns out at least the syntax, just to make sure how is it even possible without breaking the soundness of NISIC. So it turns out that the NISIC that we will use will be NISIC for homomorphic languages. So what does it mean as a homomorphic language? It means that if you have two valid instances, x plus x prime is also in the language. So there are natural languages which are homomorphic in this, and in particular, we will see one. And I claim that a homomorphic music for homomorphic language 
It means that if you have two proofs, pi and pi primes are proof for two statements x and x prime, if you add up the proofs, you simultaneously, you right away get a proof for x plus x prime, which luckily is in the language. So it's kind of, this notion only makes sense for homomorphic languages because otherwise you break soundness. But luckily, because look, these are valid inputs, so they have proof, you add them up, it's still a valid thing, so there is no contradiction that you can get a proof for a valid statement. Soundness only says that you cannot get proofs for fake statements. So this is just, you know, this is just a syntax that shows that it's conceivable to have these homomorphic properties, right? And uh, this is really inspired, uh, this notion is really inspired by a paper of uh, Mira and Melissa, uh, uh, which used, uh, which, you know, we use the fact, uh, you know, randomizable and malleable NISICs. We kind of have to go just a bit, you know, one step further that we even change the statements in some sense. But um, anyway, so it turns out that once, the point is that if you have both encryption schemes are homomorphic, which is easy to satisfy by itself, the language of they both encrypt the same thing is easily homomorphic. It's easy to see that, you know, if these two guys encrypt the same messages and another two guys encrypt the same messages, you add them up, they both encrypt the sum of those two messages. So this is trivially a homomorphic language. And now I claim it's very easy to, at least the statement, it's very easy to randomize. It's actually very easy to randomize the whole thing. If you have homomorphic NISICs and homomorphic encryption schemes, syntactically, here is how I randomize it. So C1 is part of the public. I'm not allowed to touch it. So this should be encryptions of the same message, so I will randomize it. I will add a random encryption of zero. Okay? Well, but let's look at the resulting ciphertext. I can write it also as C1, C2 plus encryption of 0, 0, encryption of 0, R. Right? I mean, this is just because the encryption is homomorphic. So for this, I have the proof. For this statement, I have the proof. But I don't have any witnesses. I don't know anything. But here, this is essentially an encryption of 0 for which I know the witness. What is the witness? It's 0, R. R I chose myself. Right? So essentially, the new statement I got is the old statement plus a statement for which I know the witness. So what I can do, I can generate a fresh NISIC for this statement, add it to the old NISIC, and I get a valid NISIC. So this is just syntactically that if I have these properties, I can randomize syntactically stuff. Okay, so Hotek tells me that I should uh, uh, finish soon, and okay, maybe like three minutes, I'll uh, skip a lot of things. So anyway, this was like the important thing, and okay, well, so this is actually, okay, so maybe like three minutes on the most important property. This is kind of the key new property that we get. So this is at least, we managed to show that if we have this magic things, we can have um, this property is now the novel property. And intuitively, the novel property needs something from E2. Because I used everything else, right? I used, uh, you know, properties of encryption scheme E1. I used the soundness and so on. Uh, but I didn't, uh, uh, you know, use anything about E2. And it turns out, if you just run the definition of leakage indistinguishability, here is a new security property from E2 that you need. So this is a security property. It's very cute. As you'll see, it's precisely in between chosen plaintext and chosen ciphertext security. So the property is this, that given intuitively L le bits of leakage of the ciphertext, so usually you see the challenge ciphertext. Here, if you don't only see some partial information about the challenge ciphertext, you cannot uh, produce a related ciphertext. So formally, the adversary gets public key. He chooses two messages. Challenger encrypts one of them, but instead of giving the full ciphertext to the attacker, the adversary gets only L bits of leakage on the ciphertext. So you cannot see the entire ciphertext. The attacker has essentially produces another ciphertext C prime. It makes the decryption query on this C prime, and he wins if decryption of C prime is, uh, is equal to B. Right? So it's not very hard. To, so we call it L leakage of ciphertext non-malleability. So intuitively, it's kind of uh, you know it's kind of a weird notion. And it turns out it's not very hard to see that it lies is precisely in between chosen plaintext and chosen ciphertext security. Just kind of, this is kind of cute, this direction, why does it lead here? Because if the scheme is even one, leakage and non-malleable secure, so you can say, look, assume the scheme is not chosen plaintext secure. How do I break this? Well, I look at the ciphertext, I, I have a distinguisher who you know, distinguishes encryption of zero of encryption of one. That's my leakage function. I look at the ciphertext, I just, Leak the bit whether it's encryption of 0, 1, and I break the scheme. And I just re-encrypt, let's say, 0, 1. So it's kind of trivial that uh, this notion implies chosen plaintext security. It's a little bit less trivial, but also in two minutes you can see that uh, non-malleability implies this. And the challenge, of course, is you can say, oh, great, just use non-malleable encryption. But remember, we need our encryptions to be homomorphic, right? Encryption E2 has to be homomorphic for the syntax, and this is a new property that we need. 
So the question is, is it possible to have this thing? So CPA is trivial to do holomorphic, right? But it's not probably going to be leakage non-malleable. This is leakage non-malleable, but it cannot probably be homomorphic. Can I do something in between? Okay, and this is kind of, uh, so anyway, this is a summary, maybe I'll skip. But essentially we show that everything will work out if we have E1, E2, and pi, which are homomorphic, and E2 has this novel property. And uh, okay, in one minute I'll wrap up, maybe I will not. So it's very non-trivial to instantiate those things. I just wanted to give you the summary of this construction. So luckily homomorphic physics, there is this paper of gross Sahai, which happens to be homomorphic. It's just a beautiful paper, but it's only for restricted classes of languages. But luckily, these classes of languages are powerful enough for us. Um, it's secure under the scalene assumptions. That's why we are stuck with scalene assumptions. So this is a magic box that essentially you know, uh, pushes these things through. But there is a lot of other work, as, is, as you see, we need to be done. Anyway, this is a, re a reasonable assumption, so I will not uh, talk more. Homomorphic encryption, E1 is trivial. Just use Elgamal encryption, or you know, it's easy to generalize it for K-linear. So I forgot. So K-linear for K equals 1 is just the DH assumption. So. Let's just assume the DH assumption. Uh, and for E2, it turns out that we can use kramer shoop light encryption. So for those of you know, Kramer, so there is a full kramer shoop encryption, which is not homomorphic intuitively, because there is this component which you know, is like hash of something, and it cannot be homomorphic because it's CCA2. <coughs> there is a CCA1 version of kramer shoop which is kramer shoop light, which is easily homomorphic. There is no weird components. You can just multiply those Rs, just propagate. But it's only CCA1 security. In general, it doesn't imply leakage of non malleability. But if you look at the proof, uh, I mean, I'm not going to tell you intuition, but it's not very hard in two minutes. I would be able to tell you intuition. It's just, you know, the di directly the easy adaptation of Kramer Shoe proof shows that it has this incomparable property of uh, leakage non malleable security. And it gives you leakage one quarter, but you can kind of add more elements in the public key. And you can get like one minus epsilon leakage non malleability. So anyway, to conclude, so this is what we have. Uh, at the end, we constructed a leakage resilient one way relation based on K-linear assumption. The leakage is roughly speaking one over K plus one, depending, but you know, the assumption is better. So the highest K, the lower the leakage, but the more believable the assumption is. And it's really practically efficient. There is a constant number of group elements, well, constant maybe like 40, but you know, it's, it's a constant. But I mean, it's, there is no PCPs, no cook leaven reductions or anything like that. And, uh, and this application, as I said, using, heavily using prior work adapted to continuous leakage setting, we show how to build the scheme. And we even, it's, it, that was actually very surprising, especially for signatures, that we could actually preserve efficiency. So this was actually a highly non-trivial bullet, but you know, it's only one bullet, but there was a lot of work in this bullet. Uh, and okay, I will not mention, I'll talk offline about leakage during key update. We kind of observe, following implicit observation of um, this uh, very nice paper, we not that if you have a scheme which is L leakage resilient without any leakage during key updates, you can kind of trade one bit of leakage during key updates for one bit of leakage inside key update, but unfortunately you pay a factor of two to the K in security, in the running time of the attacker. Uh, and this is, uh, it's a very cute, but it's totally trivial observation if you think about it. Corollary is that if you have an L leakage resilient scheme in the queued setting, it's automatically, it can tolerate order log of security parameter leakage during key update. So, um, so the moral is, unless you break this barrier, which is a very difficult question, it's a great open question to allow higher leakage during key updates, but unless you can break this barrier, don't even bother with a more complicated model, just do a clean, beautiful model, which is already complicated, you know, and then automatically for free get security with leakage during key updates. But this is a very practically important thing, so it's actually very important uh, that our schemes or any other schemes that you can come up in the future will satisfy this property for encryption signatures or anything you want. So this is kind of for free, okay? Uh, we have other extensions, uh, leakage of randomness during computation. You know, all of them are non-trivial, but it turns out that our scheme uh, happens to satisfy them with some work. Uh, so for example, during signing, for one way relations, there is no randomness, you know, no local randomness. It's just you have a secret key and you verify it. But if you sign messages, you know, the signatures could be probabilistic. So maybe not only your secret key leaks, but the randomness during signing leaks. Or for key agreement, you choose G to the A, G to the B, maybe those guys leak and so on. Right, so uh, it turns out that with some non-trivial work, uh, we managed to do it, but unfortunately our signature uh, and ID, uh, ID, sorry, our ID schemes in AKA are only, uh, sorry, 
signatures in IKEA only in the random oracle model, ID schemes in the standard model. So, uh, and you know, there, is some, there are some more extensions. Uh, so there is a very nice uh, paper of Vinod, which uh, unfortunately he's not going to talk about here, but it shows how to extend, uh, uh, I mean, it's totally different scheme, you know, beautiful techniques, that, but they also show how to get continuous leakage resilient public key encryption, and even like more advanced stuff like IB. Uh, and it leads also to an alternative construction of continuous leakage resilience, one way relation and signatures. Uh, ironically and implicitly, even though they, they had like a very long, like 50 page, you know, proof of this kind of thing, uh, implicitly uh, they also build uh, a leer. So some, some implicitly they, even though they do encryption, but if you look at the public key secret key relation, it also builds a new uh, leakage indistinguishable uh, randomizable relation. Uh, and ironically, it's, you know, it's a very different technique, but they use the same assumptions. They don't use explicitly gross or high proofs, but the algebra they use, you know, is based on the same assumptions. There is some magic that from very different angles, uh, you know, we came up uh, with the same scheme. And even the scheme, it's also very nice, the scheme actually has better leakage, one over k, as opposed to one over k plus one that we have. And this is kind of the observations that we have improving a slightly, you know, a weaker bound that they originally had. So anyway, so this is uh, state of the art. And uh, uh, I'm sorry for, you know, the paper is available on imprint. Uh, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> we are really running over time, so let's say offline, yeah. offline to the break. And then we'll resume at, uh, when does the next session resume? Uh, six, six minutes, minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, six minutes? Oh boy. Six minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, next week. Uh, okay, there we go.